all in order. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are you all here? Um, we'll call up the uh, school committee or superintendent, whoever is going to make the presentation. Just like to say publicly, apologize for not being there last week as planned. I know that was difficult for everybody. Well, um, I don't know if the rest of the school committee wants to come up because basically we have to call to order yes. if you're going to deliberate. So. We invite ourselves. Oh, sure. It's a big table. Come on down. Sure. <laughs> we usually have family styles. <laughs> Selectman, the town administrator of the school committee, and the superintendent of schools for a town of Granby Department of Public Facilities. This was developed by a shared services working group that consisted of two school committee members, Mr. Bale, Mr. Martin, and myself. Um, we took some uh, samples of uh, memoranda and took a look at uh, one in particular and then uh, worked our way through it to create one that we believe fits our, our needs appropriately. You also have in front of you a job description for director's position um, that we also uh, called from some samples as well as our own um, job description for uh, the maintenance person on the school side. So. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, I, I got this at the and so I have some questions that I can start. <coughs> So on, on the page one of a <coughs> one, two, third paragraph down, carrying which, out which document do you look at? The memory. The memory. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, yep. In carrying out its responsibility, Director of Public Facilities, Director shall coordinate for each department building except for noted the following, and it lists the different things. Is there any role for DPW under that? Chris? In what manner, Mary? In any manner. Oh, uh, I guess I'm asking what is the role of the DPW as it relates to that paragraph? Or that, uh, I, would, I would presume it's only going to be Dave Turcott, who is the maintenance slash custodian for the town of Granby Building. It would only be Dave? Yeah. Okay, so like for when they do snow <laughs> and things like that, they'd continue to do that through yes. the DPW? Yes, I think that's outlined in those bullets down below. Mm -hmm. Below that paragraph, mm -hmm. we talk about snow plowing. Pedestrian snow removal. Yes, yes. So that, the DPW would do that? Yes, Conti so that continue, to, continue to do that as they do now, and which is then back charged as part of the in-kind services that is charged back to the school on an annual basis. And same thing with the landscaping, groundskeeping. Yes. Uh, that would be DPW. Yes. As well. Because they currently do that now. Yes. Mm -hmm. And on the school side, that would be uh, the custodians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And so, those people under that, under maybe <coughs> under Dave or under this new director, the people who do the snow removal, the people who do the landscaping, groundskeeping. For, you know, are they under the direction would, of the that DPW? Would still be DP, that would still be DPW, yes, because <coughs> snow plowing operations are time town wide operation, and they are handled through the snow and ice budget through the DPW department. Okay, I guess my, then my only question is somewhere in there. Don't you think we should put that 
because it talks about the um, the under the direction of the director, they, he would have or she would have um, control of, of what goes on. But nowhere in there does it talk about the DPW, if some of these same people are going to be under the direction of the DPW. And I think if that's the case, then we should have some clarity in there about the role of the DPW if, if in fact, what Chris is saying, their employees are under the direction of Dave, if that's the case. Dave's employees will continue to be under Dave's direction. The custodial staff will be under the direction of the part of the facilities manager, um, with the exception of Dave Turcott, who might serve in kind of both capacity. No, he would end up under this public building. Oh, yeah. 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 But that's only because Dave is currently is the town's person who takes care of these buildings right. that are mentioned mm -hmm. in this MOA. Yeah. He's not in there in his capacity as a member of the DPW. And he the MOA has, a, pardon me? He becomes part of under this. He does because then, the yeah. Direction yeah. Of the director. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he's no longer under the direction of Dave. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what about Lance, someone like a Lance? Lance will be under this person's direction. Under the new director of facilities? Yes because he is custodial, let's say a custodial contract, so he would be oversee that contract, yes. And I think the bullet with regard to snow removal differentiates between street snow removal, which is under the DPW, and pedestrian snow removal, which is not for us, that's a uh, different name. So I think that's what separates those two things. Yeah, because that's on the school side. Right. Yeah, what I'm thinking of is, let's say, um, the DPW is over there doing cutting the grass. Correct. So that person, if I understand this correctly, is still under the direction. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. That's part of the in kind contribution. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and um, under Article 3, it talked about. Um, the job description, does that come after, or I don't have that. It wasn't given to me with what you gave me last week. I think it makes sense to have some check-ins, maybe at least for the first year, because this is such a new position. Maybe do quarterly check-ins with whoever takes over this position. Um, whoever gets hired, um, it's just the following I think it's in terms of check-ins with whom? Both, whoever this person is reporting to, maybe yeah. have some quarterly meetings where you sit down and say, because this is new, and you're going to have a person mm -hmm. reporting to two people, yeah, right. and it's going to be a little complicated. It will happen probably more frequently than that. <clears throat> I don't mm -hmm. see us waiting quarterly address things I see tweaking, probably monthly maybe even tweaking the job description yeah. as you mm -hmm. go along mm -hmm. tweaking the you know MOA after mm -hmm. a year or something if, it, if necessary mm -hmm. so are you saying Deanna to put that into the MOA I think uh, you know that was just my own thought something yep. that I after reviewing it came up with I don't think that's a bad idea well that should be something in the job description that indicates that so that you know, hire someone and then six months later say that's, you know, if you want to change the job description, you can't do that. So we want to make sure there's some type of wording in there that allows um, for just what you're saying. Because I think we'll be looking for feedback from this person because this person is going to be in a unique position to say, you know what, I think maybe we, you know, sure. this might, doesn't work so well for me or. I'm sure there's I'm things that we haven't foreseen that are going exactly. to come Exactly. Mm -hmm. sure. So I think we need to allow some flexibility to make some changes. Yeah, And under Article 5, Building Managers, um, 
You should partner should have the building manager. The building manager should have the right to provide direction to any custodial staff working in the building. The building manager should be consulted. Behind. What if, I know you talk about a conflict um, between town administrator and superintendent mm -hmm. in terms of agreement. What if there's a conflict between the director and one of these building managers? Is there some language in there? Well, basically that's in response to um, the Ed Reform Act of 1993 where the principals are the um, supervisors of personnel within their buildings. So if there is some sort of conflict and with the, our custodians, there is a process by which that gets resolved in their contract that involves the superintendent being the next level. Should that be noted any place? Mm -hmm. uh, just no, I mean, this is how we do business. Okay. Standard, yeah. And on our side, it would be Chris. And under um, Article 7, uh, Capital Items and Equipment, it talks about um, the equipment. Now, again, getting back to the DPW, is there an instance where we'll be taking any of the equipment and putting it in this department from the DPW? Not that I can see. Not that I no, can see. Right? No. So that does not yeah. apply to any no, it would of be equipment? For anything that's used in the context of what's in Article 1 around custodial care and cleaning and, and what surrounds the buildings proper, not the general work of the DPW. Yeah. No. Well, I'm only asking because is it, hasn't the DPW been in charge of the buildings under your direction right up until this point? So would there be any equipment or anything that we would have to Maybe a snowblower or something that Dave uses. But it's, you know, it's not taking like picking out vehicles or anything right. large. It's, so there's you know, really maybe no a buffing machine, maybe, yeah. you know, things of that nature. But It could conceivably go into this department. Yes. If there should be no overlap between the services that the DPW is providing in this particular role. Right. If there is any service uh, provided by uh, the D DPW, mm -hmm. We will continue to receive those costs as part of the in-kind expense, and it's going to be treated uh, as such in the budget. So the way this is written, it's completely from the facilities perspective, and the only reason that individual who's currently serving a dual role under uh, DPW and facilities is mentioned here, or not in name, but at least the position, uh, the position <laughs> is because he is doing the facilities work as well, not because he is partly DPW, partly facilities uh, related. Uh, resource within within the town. Okay. Well, I think uh, historically there's been a pretty close working relationship between the highway and, and the school people. Yes. As yes. far as sharing work or equipment if needed anyways, I don't see right. that changing anyways. No, yeah. just what, whatever is happening right now is going to have to continue to happen. <clears throat> and then um, under nine, let's see, director Shelby. Um, in terms of, of scheduling department buildings and grounds for regular business hours and on weekends, etc. Um, so that would include what Kath, Kathy does now. That director would do that. She doesn't. She schedule build um, building use or something where people come in and want to uh, use a building for a meeting or something. She we would still. We would still. Ma we would still maintain our calendar. We have to. We have to maintain our calendar, but it would just be a sign-off by him on a form. No, that's all. Just be another line to sign off. So you'd still go to Kathy, not yep. this person. Yep. And then there'd be a form that she would hand him that this guy would have to, or this individual would have to sign off on. And, and the school has a similar policy there. Mm -hmm. Building. Yeah. So. Oh, you talking about like two frames? Then? No. Um, no, you library. Know how, she li schedules yeah. the library. She, she does all the scheduling. Yeah. And so what? I just want to know how that will affect her, if at all. And it sounds like it. It won't. No. It still goes through her with a sign off by that person. Mm -hmm. um, all fees. And then the next page, page <coughs> five. All fees collected by the department for the use of school and non-school department buildings shall continue to deposit be deposited into existing revolving funds. 
So we have a revolving fund. We don't charge fees for our buildings. Okay, so point. then that does not apply. I was I no. want to know what our revolving fund. No, is. no, we don't charge fees for our buildings at this point in time. But it will be under if he's going at to. At some point, we may want to institute a fee. At this point. So that's just to provision for that eventually. Mm -hmm. Facilities person is going to recommend a fee scale for use of. The building so would that go into the school revolving no. fund or would no. we no would we okay so we would start a new revolving fund for that we would have the board Just would have to decide what they would want to do with those fees yes okay so we would have to we don't have one we would have to create so, one so but for for now chris like for instance the school fee would go into the school they currently yeah, have they currently have a account. school mm -hmm. facility account revolving fund and that pays through. their custodians that work whatever. over time and so then how who would administer that school yeah the school was yeah. yeah we would invoice whoever was using whoever was using the building even though it combines to it combines services for the town and the schools if we continue to do what we're doing right now you know we we use the school uh, buildings for certain activities and right. charge fees for that it would be the same thing and therefore it would stay on the school side is that a uh, is that a break-even thing or is that a <coughs> there's a little bit of money that gets carried from year to year but that also helps with any maintenance that may come as a result so, of so that would be all spent on building tear. maintenance anyways mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So it's designated for mm -hmm. And um, on page five, the next to the last paragraph, it says uh, during the transitional period, that, that paragraph right there, um, following the period the town maintenance employee shall become a member of the collective bargaining. So after that 18 months, it does that. Presently, is there a discrepancy right, that exists right now between pays? I believe so, yes. Is it significant? Uh, I'm not sure. What the pay scale is. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what the pay scale is on the town side, but we have to obviously work all that off. Well, that wouldn't. It's from this. It doesn't sound like it's going to be worked out until the eight, to eighteen months, the transition period. So, well, the I'm just thinking of if if I were an employee, either the town side or the custodial side, and whoever is getting more money. And I'm asked to do the same thing. I I might have a problem with that. So I'm just. We do <coughs> talk about that. I'm, and we I'm also asking are. How are we going to handle? But that? we are also in the process of doing a classification and compensation study on the town side. So we are presuming that the town side person will be compensated at a comparable rate, probably what the union is being paid. I can't answer that question right now until the study's done. If, if I understand it correctly, the school has custodial and then they have maintenance. We have one maintenance employee who's okay. about to retire. We're not refilling that position okay. due to budget cuts. But, and this person does custodial and maintenance. Well, he has a new job description. It's just maintenance only now. So is he going to go in as a maintenance person or is he going to go in as a custodial person? He would end up being maintenance. Because the personnel board just had the new job description voted at town meeting, correct, Al? We're talking about Dave Corcott. He's now maintenance. He's no longer a custodial person. Right. We just had his new job description approved at town meeting. Right. So as part of this agreement, he would be maintenance, not custodial type right. of staff. Right. So was your intent to replace your maintenance guy? Or, or we made a cut in the budget. So now you're going to be adding the maintenance person back into the not your budget but in, back into this <clears throat> well it would somehow have to come into the mix the custodial contract expires uh, in 2017 so obviously next year um, it will be time to go back to the bargaining table so in by law the selectmen are invited to be a part of that process anyway no matter what the school is doing yet you sign off on the contract so certainly we would anticipate that one of you would be at least, you know, at the table during negotiations. Correct me if I'm wrong, Judy, mm -hmm. but whether or not this had happened, that position wasn't going to exist anyway. Right. It wasn't going to be there. So, so it's not because of this that that position mm -hmm. is, is being. So you don't have a maintenance person. You weren't going to have a maintenance person. Uh, 
Not under the maintenance title, no. Okay. But now you basically will again. So you from you the will now yeah. from yes. the town side. Right. And that was the intent, or? Well, it's our intent, I don't know. Um, Mary, to answer your concern about, and Dan, about um, revisiting job descriptions and whatever, we could add a sentence to the end of Article 10 that would say during the transitional period, uh, the director shall give feedback to the town administrator and the superintendent regarding the memorandum of agreement and job description, any changes to be brought forth to the two bodies, and if that works for everybody, yeah. we'll add that in. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a good one. <clears throat> And then um, <clears throat> on page six of eight, um, it says that it's talking about if the superintendent and town administrator uh, are unable to uh, reach consensus or agreement, then the matter will be resol resolved by an ad hoc committee. Um, and it says of two, two people, one from each like board, of, uh, select board and the school committee. So that means the ad hoc committee is on the two people, correct? Yep. Okay. And so that, um, if there is a tie, then the matter just waits or is and it's not dissolves. Actually. Right. Because mm -hmm. there's really no fair way to make it uh, an odd number. Mm -hmm. And, um, Um, and in eight at the bottom of the page, except that we from eight on, and there's, a, there's another time too. You change the wording from uh, town or from the select board to the town, but you still use school committee. Is there a reason for that? Because all along, he's talking about that. Um, I mean, not uh, 13, yes, okay. yeah. And the same thing up above, while well, you do have school department there, who, like, who is the town and who is the school department? Is it the select board and the school committee? And if so, those words were used throughout the whole agreement, but it changed there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, do we still mean the select board and the school committee uh, uh, for number one on inventory and number uh, on 13 um, is town the select the select board again, um, or or is there a different meaning that you intended for that? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think you could add Board of Selectmen in there because technically this is a town vote anyway. Yeah. With regard to I just being thought maybe there was a reason that. that you changed because So I mean somebody it wouldn't preclude, say, somebody doing a citizen's petition. You know. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So we could add by the authority of the Board of Selectmen, the school committee, and the town. If that would bring some comfort to folks. Does it change the meaning if we change the word town to be select board? It doesn't. Really. So no, we, we can't, can't do that. Town, so. mm. Yeah, yeah the school can only represent yeah. the school. We can't represent the schools. So. Yeah, the reason why school department and school committee are, my understanding, are used differently in those two sections because we're talking about authority and the authority to sign a contract on behalf of the school department is with, with the uh, school committee. Yeah. Okay. But so I see, I see the question that you're asking with yeah. regards to the town. So we're going to we're change it to board of selectmen. Um, to be consistent. Probably to okay. be consistent. All right. All right. So and then um, on the on the one I got last week. It has the school buildings and it doesn't list the municipal buildings. Yeah, Do you have that on there? And could you just list them to me right now? It would be Council on Aging Building, our DPW building, 
public safety building, Carnegie building to differentiate from the new library building. Yeah. Um, annex. Two frames. No, annex we're not responsible for for maintenance. Oh. Mm -hmm. Because that's a leased facility. I'm looking at the pavilion out at Dufresne Park. There's a town building because uh, Dave does repair work there. And basically, those are the only buildings. There's like five. So that's fine. In the, library. Library. in the new library. Yeah. Now that library is under the directors. The library is under the library directors. She's the building manager. The building manager. She's the building manager, but Dave goes in and does the repair work. They don't. Okay. Higher up. Uh, fund it and all that. It gets funded through the highway department. Budget through uh, building repairs, plumbing, carpentry. Okay, I didn't know how they were budgeted. They but now it goes to this, right? Now it's transferred. Well, basically, our public buildings. Yeah. Basically, our public buildings <coughs> department will now fall under this person here instead of Dave DeRocher. So this person will be doing that budget. Dave Turcott is currently paid through that budget. That's what I'm saying. Dave Turcott's the only one who's really being affected by this for who will assign him. Can you know, tell me why Lance is it? Well, Lance will be, because, yeah. Because, oh, Lance will because be he's, he's, yeah. he's under the contracted services. Under. Right. So he'll yes. be affected as well. Yes. Those two positions. Those two positions Lance. only, but not the truck drivers, not the laborers, mm -hmm. not the, no. No. Ma or the uh, mechanic or any of those people. Those all stay under Dave DeRoche. Now, Chris, what about utilities? Are they they going to stay with the different downtown and school? Yes. Not under? Yes. Those are my questions. All right. Any other questions? Motion? Oh, um, and one other thing. Who, I mean, is this under the towns? Did you type this? Could we just... Um, do use the word select board um, consistently rather than select. Is that the official name? Select board. Your website does not say that. No, I know. So, okay. So I'll make that change. Show up. That's Thank you. Um, so I have as amendments to change board selectment to select board um, in Article 10 to add a sentence that says during the transitional period the director shall give feedback to the town administrator and the superintendent regarding the memorandum of, of agreement and job description and any changes uh, or suggested changes would be brought forward to the select board and the school committee. Um, change the word town um, on article 16 to select board and then to add the um, town buildings in the exhibit. Did I capture everything? Motion to approve the contract, is that correct? As amended. As amended. As amended. I'll make a motion to approve it as amended. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Now on your side. Uh, motion to approve as the amended. MOA as amended. <laughs> Please. Good call. I say. No. No, so is there a motion? motion? You make the motion, oh, okay. I guess. I make yeah. the motion to um, approve as amended. Approve as amended. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll get that. <laughs> Second. All right. All in favor? All right. All right. Job description. That's the next. Motion to approve. Uh, was that amended also to include um, potential <coughs> changes? I'll have to put that in the MOA. Okay. Will that, should that also be in the job description, I think? Because that's what they're going to be hired under, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, your MOA says that they would give feedback to the town administrator and superintendent, and then the town administrator and superintendent would bring forward, forward any changes, suggested changes to the two bodies. Okay. We agree to that, but what about the person who's hired? 
they could later say this is my job description and I was hired and no matter what our agreement shouldn't it should shouldn't the job description um, add another bullet that it might be subject to change. Well, well mm -hmm. I don't think we need to do a job description. No. That would be in their contract. They're gonna contract. Right. That's so that would be part of their contract okay. yeah. that they're hired under. Because this is going to be a contract. It's going to be a contract okay. position. Okay. So you okay. put that in the contract. As long as it's in the contract. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yep. That way you're not really playing around with the job description too much. It's basically a lot of the stuff that's addressed in the contract. Yeah, because that's probably not an appropriate place to put that. So, yeah. Okay. Motion for the job Make a motion for the job description. Yes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. See if you guys can do it. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the job description? I will make a motion to approve Thank you the job description. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. I did much better than that. Hallelujah. We got used to it. All right. Is there a third motion? We're going to be even better. No, I think you're oh, okay. The third motion is to adjourn. Is there a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Great. Right. She's favor. got that one now. Good. All right. Yes. <laughs> 701, it's a beautiful thing. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming back. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the uh, collaboration. We appreciate it. Now we're running we're about 15 minutes late. Uh, call for sound board. Yeah, do you have anybody else? Or? meeting gave us money to do a classification plan. Uh, we were a new board and it took some time to learn our job. Frankly, we didn't know how we were doing. And so we waited until we thought we knew enough to go forward with the classification plan. In March, we sent out an RFP and we got one response. And Don's company is the one that responded. Um, but, and I know what you're thinking, we only got one response. However, I wouldn't say they have a monopoly in the state, but they're very popular in the state because they have, they've done studies in 40 plus cities and towns in this Commonwealth and in 10 other states. So they, uh, I have a feeling that some of the other people who might have been in the business have decided it may not be as profitable. We've settled on three tasks right now. One. We want to review and update all the job descriptions and position titles for the 29 employees we are responsible for. We want to update the position rating criteria and ensure that there's an internal equity between the positions. In other words, positions have to be rated by a set of criteria, and we want to re-examine those, update those, and uh, make sure that any position, if we have secretaries, we have three secretaries that they all have the same kind of classification in the So that's, that's what, that's what we, that, we want that to do. And we want to do an analysis of the marketplace to have an idea how positions compare with the positions in other communities, comparable communities. In other words, we want to know whether our people are well overpaid, underpaid, paid appropriately. We want some kind of standard to compare with the other communities with us. Now, we met with recently with Mr. Jacobs, and I think he will assure you that we will be involved and we have our own ideas. <laughs> Don, why you come up? Yeah, this is Don Jacobs from the Don Jacobs Consulting Chair. Sure. Yeah, yeah bring it to you. Bring it to you. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let, let me just begin by uh, giving you a little bit more explanation about who I am. Um, I appreciate the, uh, the comments by the chairman relative to our market penetration. I guess you think. But suffice it to say that um, I've been doing this type of work now for 15 years. Uh, the handout that he, we gave you tonight is really just a way to give you an overall view of everything the chairman has just indicated. Um, and over the 15 years that I've been working exclusively with cities and towns, I think it's fair to say that it's the one aspect of local government that, in my personal opinion, is probably the most difficult to manage. Um, particularly when it comes to trying to understand how you do it today and then 
Secondly, um, how would you like to do it from an ideal standpoint going forward? Uh, continuity is a critical issue from my perspective. Uh, I always say that uh, to a large extent I make a living based on a lack of continuity, a lack of consistency with respect to how cities and towns manage compensation. Um, and if I've learned anything over the 15 years that I've been doing this as a consultant, uh, the most critical aspect of doing this type of work is communication. And when I met with the personnel board, we talked a lot about that. And the chairman just alluded to the fact that not only should the personnel board be actively involved and be comfortable making recommendations with respect to how to pay positions and pay employees, but my objective in working with you is also to get the employees to a point where they're comfortable, where they understand um, how they're being treated with respect to how their positions are being paid, and secondly, how they themselves as employees are being paid. Um, and so I'd like to just give you that overview. And uh, I think that from a process standpoint, um, we are looking at three steps to conducting the study, as what I think we're referring to now as really the first phase of looking at compensation. And in this first phase, what we're really primarily talking about is paying a position. By writing job descriptions consistently, we're writing them. One of the reasons for writing them is to then be able to communicate to an employee how their positions are compared to one another based on what the town establishes as the minimum qualifications to carry out their job duties, so-called essential functions, uh, based on their essential functions, minimum qualifications being the knowledge, ability, and skill level that's required to carry out job duties and how they relate to the essential functions. Or as you were talking about with regard to the director of facilities, where he or she spends the bulk of his or her time. Uh, all of that is contained in a job description. And so by taking the time, frankly, to update those job descriptions to make sure that they're accurate, then I think the personnel board is in a position to be able to compare positions to one another uh, using a management tool that's referred to as a position rating system, which the town has used in the past. In fact, the system that, uh, that I use is very, very similar in a lot of respects um, to what the town has already been used to using, meaning the personnel board. Um, and then based on developing the classification plan, Right now you have nine classification levels. And so the first objective in developing a classification plan is to develop a grade level structure um, that is consistent with what you require employees to do and what you establish as the minimum qualifications. And then the compensation plan, which is the third objective, really is basically developing a salary range using market data from comparable municipalities as a guide, not as the be all and end all, but as a guide to help develop what I'd like to refer to as competitive, quote unquote, salary ranges. And of course, it's critical to be able to define that word competitive so we all understand what we mean by the term. Um, and those are the basic three objectives. Once that so-called classification compensation plan is in place, reviewed and approved by the personnel board, presented to the selectmen for your review and approval, then at that point, you have a structure in place that I think then you can focus on developing ways to pay the employees. And at the present time, we pay employees with a step system uh, that consists of 10 steps. Uh, but that will be just one of several options that we'll look at or consider uh, in, again, developing a way to pay employees con consistently, just as we're trying to do so uh, with positions. Overall time frame wise, I think we're looking at roughly uh, 60 to 90 days for completion of the entire project, um, basically within two months we should have a draft classification and compensation plan prepared so the personnel board can then begin review and development and then bring it to the board of select. And is that through job descriptions as well? Including job descriptions, okay, correct. That's with We're that's starting with that. Yeah. Right, so the first step, as, as yes, the chairman right. indicated, is to review and update your current job descriptions to make sure that they're accurate. And so accurate means two things. Accurately describing what you require an employee to do today and then accurately describing uh, what you establish as the minimum qualifications to carry out those job duties. So do you meet with those employees? Absolutely. I think involvement of employees is absolutely critical. Let's start with that. Right. So the first step really is to meet with employees, explain everything we're proposing to do, just like we're discussing this evening, uh, before we do it. And do you do that as a group? Uh, usually, initially, as a group, just because it's convenient and we don't want to disrupt you know, the workplace and so forth. The meeting with the employees individually really comes at the next step, and that is once we've drafted a uh, job description and we have a questionnaire form 
that we typically ask employees to fill out to tell us what they do today, what they feel are their minimum qualifications. From that questionnaire or marked up version of the current job description, whichever way is easiest for the employee, um, we'll write a draft job description and then come back and meet with the employees individually. So the second step, um, we like to take the time to meet with employees individually for a couple of reasons. One, to make sure they're comfortable with the process. And I always explain to employees that no one should disagree with the process. Everyone should be able to understand it. And hopefully everyone should agree to it so that going forward from a continuity standpoint, um, everyone understands how these types of subjective decisions are made. Once we've met with the employee for the second time individually, then we'll go back and make any further changes to the draft job description, send it back to them for them to review it again, as well as their department head or supervisor, maybe a board or committee chairman, as the case may be. Um, and then at that point, we've completed really the first objective or task. We've written a draft job description. Then we're comfortable then using those descriptions as a basis to develop a classification plan, which is the second objective. So involvement of employees is absolutely essential. In fact, I would go so far as to say, as, you know, again, as the chairman indicated, I've, I've probably done at this point almost 100 some odd classification compensation studies. The number one characteristic in managing compensation well, frankly, in my opinion, is how well your employees understand it. That is critically important. I can't emphasize that enough. As, in, as a, I guess, an indicator of why I feel so strongly about it, one of the last things that is included in our so-called final report is a set of administrative policies which we will present through the personnel board to yourselves for the board of selectmen to approve basically describing everything we've done in conducting the study whether it's writing a job description developing a classification plan or thoroughly developing a compensation plan all of that will give you in writing the methodology the steps that we follow and frankly we'll ask you to approve it assuming you approve the classification compensation plan we want you to approve a set of administrative policies so that going forward you have a written document that tells everyone how you do this. When you talk about continuity, um, and you talked about continuity within the town and then continuity um, in terms of other towns um, Marketplace, right. so that it would be competitive, et cetera. So you're most likely, you're not reinventing the wheel, you've got, you, you've got some tools out there that right. you use from various um, well, communities, correct? That's absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, <coughs> what I explained to Chris and the personnel board, what we do a little bit differently than the way you've surveyed the marketplace in the past, is we like to use both operational and demographic criteria. So a good example of an operational criteria would be, as you were talking about your director of facilities, how many buildings you maintain, or is the person in that position to maintain. Uh, that's not a demographic criteria, that's an operational criteria. What I have found, you know, from a credibility standpoint is to ensure you that we use data correctly or the most effectively possible uh, is to use both demographic and operational criteria. So we're not bound by, say, for example, towns that are contiguous to the town of Granby. We want to seek out other positions in other municipalities that not only demographically, per capita, budget, uh, population size, and so forth, but also from an operational standpoint are comparable. And then use those two criteria really to help us select um, municipalities to ultimately really help us, I mentioned earlier, define the word competitive. In developing the range, salary range, that's what we have in mind. Uh, we want to be able to explain both how we get the grade levels and what they mean, but also we want to be able to explain um, where the salary numbers come from, meaning the salary range numbers. Um, and use market data again as a guide to help us do that. In your experience with this kind of work, um, do you often find where the the old, let's say, classification um, bumps up, or the old classification bumps down with a certain position? You mean in terms of the number of grade levels of or no, where, where I think just the rating of the, cla the classification of a different job. I mean, the relation of a different judgment. We have, when we see the job descriptions, then we'll know that better. Yeah. Right. But, but we, it's conceivable, we're, right? We're try, right? Yes, it's conceivable. We're trying to find out exactly what people are doing. We haven't done this. The town hasn't done it in 15, 16 years. So we know some of these job descriptions may not be as accurate as they were 16 years ago. And that's what we want to start with. I mean, make no mistake. When you look at your current classification plan, 
and how positions have been assigned to the, the uh, nine grade levels. There aren't nine levels of responsibility in the town of Granby. It doesn't exist. So I can honestly tell you tonight, I have no idea what, I have no preconceived number of classification or grade levels would be accurate relative to this particular community. But I can assure you there aren't nine levels of responsibility, but yet you have nine pay levels. Yeah. That's a red flag. We will yeah. have some significant So I can assure you that, classifications. Right. There will be fewer grade levels. I just don't know how many. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I'd like to share with, with you also <coughs> in that regard is that um, in a sense, the check and balance with respect to the number of grade levels is really your organizational structure. If you were to draw an org chart of the town of Grant relative to it, you were talking about the director of facilities as who reports to whom from the most responsible to the least responsible, most independent in carrying out job duties to the least independent. That's what I'm alluding to with regard to um, the number of grade levels. So your classification structure really needs to match your organizational structure. And that's the check and balance. So that when you add a new position or you create a new department or whatever changes from an organizational standpoint you make, your classification plan or the process, I should say, to develop and maintain your classification plan is meant to react to those proposed changes before they happen, not afterwards. Any other questions? You're not looking at it across the board equality, though. I mean, you wouldn't take an apartment head with two employees and put them on necessarily on the same level as an apartment head. Well, we're classifying positions, not employees. No, I know that. But in other words, you're classifying a position of an apartment head. Is there a big difference between one who has one or two employees as to one that has 20? No, we're not touching department heads. Because they're all contracts. They're all okay. individual contracts. How are you going to deal with the uh, custodial issue? Was that discussed, Chris, at all with the school? No. Because we haven't there, discussed anything with this gentleman yet. No, with the school. We said, we, Regarding what? Well, the fact that we're classifying employees on a, on a personnel plan, they won't be a part of that because they. No, because they're, they're, they're unionized. Contract. They're union. Yeah, okay, what will happen to our maintenance person? At the end of the transition period, he becomes a union employee. Remember, that was all part of the. So that life. position won't exist under personnel bylaw. Correct. Right. Yeah, the other thing I would just mention would be, you know, again, it's all about the process, how you make these decisions. Mm -hmm. I would submit to you that the same process that we'll follow in doing this particular study will be the exact same process you'll use to pay positions and employees, whether they're organized or not. <coughs> it really doesn't make any difference. Whereas the concept of paying people based on what you require them to do would apply equally to a unionized position or organized position as it would to a non-union position. It really doesn't make any difference. So, um, I mean, I, th I think consistency is the name of the game with respect to how you pay positions, employees, and in establishing this particular plan, um, make no mistake about it, you know, the same process I think would be followed ultimately with regard to the union positions. Well, except that you're in this situation taking an existing union that's negotiated a contract, mm -hmm. and you're now theoretically comparing that to a group of people who are non-union who may have the same job description, may be classified differently in an entirely different pay and benefit scale. Yeah, well, we, we, we need to be aware of, from an internal equity standpoint, we certainly need to be aware of how other positions are paid both in the town and or other comparable positions in the school department. All right, if you do your due diligence in this process, we could use that as our as our guide for that could be part of it absolutely yeah i mean i i would think and that's what we're we've been trying to to get to is some sort of equity right i mean just equity in our minds not with data or anything like that well but, but you're right and, and, and there really are two aspects of equity one is internal which i would submit to you is the most important and then secondly is the external equity that you were just referring to how, how many non-union personnel board employees do we have there? 29, right 29. now. 29. And we're losing one. It was seven, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just one more question. Yeah, please, um, sure. So, you asked the question about department heads, and, and we were told that this does, not, this does not deal with department heads. Do you normally deal with department heads at uh, uh, your <laughs> firm when you do this? Usually. I mean, it, and why aren't you now? Well, I would submit to you that we should write job descriptions for all positions, whether, whether department heads are compensated in a similar way as your other non-union employees. If some of them have, as I think was just mentioned, employment agreements, then those are really separate. But the job description itself 
uh, or the writing of the job sheet, and, and my, my recommendation would be to include them. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if they are not under our jurisdiction, all right? Do they have employment? They are, they're, they're, yeah, they're individual contracts. Okay. Yeah. So they're in, they're negotiated individually. They have nothing to do with us. Yeah. No. no it's obviously, you're, you're free to negotiate an employment agreement with those particular individuals. But I would still submit to you that the job description, or is what you require them to do and what you establish as the minimum qualifications, is still the exact same issue. And so exactly. if they don't write job descriptions for one set of nine. They're not even employees. So does yeah. that come you, you, with your fee? You, yes. You will also have access yes. to all our results, which you may. Well, figure out how to apply in those situations. Yeah, but if that comes with your fee, mm -hmm. can you can he do that? Yeah. I mean, it's, I have no problems doing it. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to write jobs for 29 so-called non-union, let's call them support I mean, it positions. has to be approved by us anyways, but while right. we have the expertise, the you know, you have data, I you have all this stuff, I mean, if we're gonna write and you do them in other communities, Right. Why wouldn't you do them for us? Exactly. And it's Theoretically, you've all, already done that when you've made your individual contracts with the employees. Yeah, well, but it is yes really. and no, no. not really. I said theoretically. Yeah, theoretically. <laughs> theoretically yeah. Uh, well, we want to be actual. Well, could, could, could we request that as a board? Yeah, yeah I mean, you can do anything yeah, you want to the board. Problems. It's not going to cost you any more money. All right, That's good. not the issue. Get ready, Chris. I believe, I believe, I believe, as part of the RFP, I did. Yeah, I think it was. Department heads as I positions it was. to be considered because right. we did have job descriptions right. that were still on the classification plan schedule C. Absolutely. That have never been removed due to the fact that they are contract employees. So no matter what aspect of the study we're talking about, it has should meet the standard of being done consistently. That doesn't mean you have to, but there should be a reason why not. Otherwise, you should. And so writing job description, there should be one format for a job description right across the board, union, non-union. So does that increase your, now that you know that you, you have to do department heads, does that increase your no. 60 to 90 day? No. As uh, Chris just pointed out, in your RFP, you made reference well, I would, to. I would submit that. that we should do that. Um, make sh you know, have the consulting moment well, was part of the RFP. And, That'd be great if we could do that. Is there anything else anybody wants to add? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Nate, can you make a motion on that? To include it? It is part of the RFP. We have no problem. No, I, I think it's understood. It's understood. understood. It's understood. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Because Chris wants to do it too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Pleasure to meet you. We'll uh, probably be back in about a month or so <laughs> with, with a draft. Who's coming out? Patient. Joe, are you coming up? Yep. Okay, so Chris, I'll be in touch. I always forget to do this. Good, how about you? Thank you very much. much. Okay, so uh, thank you for seeing me, and what I'd like to do tonight um, is focus on uh, what we've done over the last 12 months, where you can find all that material, and what we plan to do going forward, and then your input in terms of focus, uh, and, and we want to make sure that we accomplish what we need to accomplish uh, within the next 12 months. Uh, the initial document here, what I'd like to do is, um, you know, I have an introduction and let's not focus on that. Um, I reiterated the mission statement which you all have here, which is to investigate, identify, and recommend solid waste disposal options, including but not limited to contracting for a curbside waste collection program, building a transfer station, or creating a solid waste district with other municipalities. <clears throat> All options should address residential waste disposal, yard waste, recycling, waste prevention, and any cost to users, taxpayers, and the town. Um, we had a meeting in September where we notified you what we were doing, and in that meeting, we were focused on the yard waste collection stuff in December, we again met and gave you a brief update. 
in February, we had a short summary, and in March, which led to a report that we submitted on March 23rd, which is the second document. So treat that as supporting. We're not going to, I mean, if you want to read through it all tonight, I have no problem with that. But uh, I'm not sure that that's necessary. And again, these documents are all published as addendums to the minutes, which are published at the website. Um, what I'd like to focus on is what our focus was, and bear with me for a minute while I read through this so that we can sort of set the table here. Initially, SWAC focused on the need to create a plan for a future transfer station based upon the assumption that in the long run, a transfer station would cost less than curbside pickup and provide the kinds of benefits the town enjoyed when the landfill was open. Early on, it was recommended that Arlene Miller be brought on board as a consultant to assist SWAC. Her experience and advice helped SWAC reassess, reassess its approach, leading to a better understanding of the cost benefits of these options. We looked at five options. One, curbside pickup with current or alternate vendor. Two, transfer station. Three, curbside pickup and recycling center. Four, yoke with another community. And five, do nothing leaving responsibility in the hands of individual town residents. SWAC addressed the economic and operational trade-offs of each choice. It was acknowledged that if current costs remain stable, there is no economic justification not to continue curbside pickup. However, the need to develop a comprehensive plan for a future transfer station as a hedge against escalating costs is imperative. Yoking with another community is a viable option. The committee does not have the authority to pursue this option, so we did nothing except contact Ludlow, Longmeadow, and Amherst DPW departments. Leaving the decision to individual residents is the least desirable option. Without economies of scales that the current approach takes, some residents might take to roadside dumping, leaving the cleanup to an already overstretched highway department. This is important. Early on, SWAC focused on site location for a future transfer station. Discussions were held with Gordon Hutchinson, which led to an inspection of properties owned by the FAA and managed by the Westover Metropolitan Development Commission. Dan Hall of Commonwealth DEP was also involved in site inspection to ensure that sites complied with statutory requirements. Although both properties <clears throat> complied, the expected rental cost purchase price led the committee to pursue other locations. SWAC also looked at property owned by the town of Granby. The gravel pit on School Street was considered and then eliminated. The committee asked the select board about other properties the town owned, but were advised none of the properties were suitable. The committee then focused on two other locations, the highway department and Cooley Field. SWAC eliminated the Cooley Field site at this time and focused on the highway department location. Dan Hall DEP met with the committee and Dave DeRochers of the highway department and inspected the Crescent Street location. The location meets yard waste and recycling center requirements. However, due to setback requirements pertaining to wetlands and wells, it was determined that the location is unsuitable for transfer station located behind the highway department at this time. Of course, of concern is the septic system abutting the property. Should the sewer line project move forward, once the septic system is replaced by the sewer system, the location would become suitable for a transfer station. As the investigatory process evolved, the committee identified immediate needs of the town and developed an incremental approach focused on near-term and long-term needs. This led to the implementation of the yard waste collection and bulky waste days, as well as the scheduling of a hazardous waste day with South Hadley in September of 2015. In addition, Arlene Miller was instrumental in integrating the town into a multi-community hazardous waste program, resulting in additional grant dollars from this year's Sustainable Materials Recovery Program. To inform town residents of these collection dates, a comprehensive communication strategy has been devised that incorporated robocalls, website flyers, inserts in the monthly senior newsletter, banner ads in Ott Communications monthly 
telephone billing statements, and advertising on the town cable channels. Under the tutelage of Arlene Miller, SWAC has become educated. At first, the committee did not understand the components of waste management. Arlene explained the elements of good waste management and provided insight into various approaches. Multiple DEP region events were attended. This helped the committee better understand how to address the waste management needs of the town and identify new initiatives the Commonwealth is championing. Dan Hall of DEP provided valuable insight into the permitting process and requirements for various solid waste management programs. Okay. In terms of what we've accomplished, one, we believe that SWAC has met its initiatives. The March 23rd report submitted to the Select Board meets the objectives of the mission statement. However, this report only scratches the surface. It is a preamble. As with all good business plans, it's a foundation to build upon. Second, SWAC understands the waste management business. This is no small accomplishment. Many hours were spent learning the nuances of the industry and understanding the options. Third, SWAC knows the SMRP grant application process. Committee members attended the DEP Sustainable Materials Recovery Program seminar, maximizing dollars by identifying all qualifying categories. The committee completed the grant application as well as the requisite survey and provided written copies to Chris Martin, thereby saving him time and effort. The committee also made sure that required documentation is posted at the town website, which is used by the DEP to verify and validate the grant application. The result this year, we will generate $3,950 in grants. In the future, the town may want to consider becoming a regional collection community for bulky waste collection or develop a regional organic waste facility to generate additional grant income and an ongoing revenue stream. Fourth, SWAC has built valuable relationships. Uh, nothing there, but we've built relationships with other community members as well as Republic. And SWAC initiatives have filled the gaps in the curbside pickup program. Although curbside pickup addresses both waste disposal and recycling needs, it does not provide for yard waste and hazardous waste disposal. To address these unmet needs, the committee implemented yard waste collection days as well as a bulky waste day, including the collection of electronics and metals in collaboration with the highway department. <clears throat> and we believe that our committee is an asset to the community. So the last thing I'd like to focus on before we open it up for discussion is the future of the Solid Waste Advisory Committee. From our perspective, the following things need to be focused on this year. A suitable site for future transfer station recycling center has not been selected. <clears throat> a comprehensive plan with estimated costs has yet to be put into place. Although in the initial document on March 23rd, we have laid out some ballpark costs. To move forward, we must select a site or sites and then develop a plan from which an RFP can be written should future economics of solid waste management costs justify a transfer station. Now, again, we cannot move forward without that because we will have to do a site plan and either hire an engineer or someone else. So we can't just go out and do a willy-nilly plan without actually selecting a physical site. Second, addressing the yoking option. Yoking with other communities that have existing facilities has yet to be addressed. Should the select board choose to renew the committee, which you've done, we recommend you empower the committee to engage in a dialogue with various communities, setting the table for future negotiations. Again, it's your call, but this needs to be done as part of the plan and as part of the <coughs> mission statement. Third, we'll continue to manage gap programs. Committee will provide oversight of existing programs, scheduling dates for yard waste, bulky waste, and hazardous waste programs as well as ensuring the existing communication program is implemented. Fourth, support DEP grant application process. We'll continue to complete grant applications and other required paperwork to qualify for grants and provide these documents to Chris Martin for his submission. We believe this saves in time and effort and ensures the town maximizes its grant income. Fifth, continue developing expertise in solid waste management Committee members will continue to build on that knowledge by attending ongoing DEP seminars and meetings. And finally, we'll maintain the relationships that we've built currently. 
So I felt it was important to go over that, obviously because of concerns by members of the committee about the completion of the task, whether we fulfilled that task, and all of your criticisms regarding that. But number one, if we do a transfer station, we need a plot of land. If you go with the Westover Metropolitan uh, Development Commission's property, they will only lease. So if you're looking at seven to fifteen thousand dollars a year to lease, while in a given year it's not a lot, you're going to have to do all the improvements to the property. So after basically twenty years, potentially you spent three hundred thousand dollars. Secondly, the question becomes where to put the location? Do we use the highway department? Do we wait and look for approval on the sewer line, which may or may not come, or the other choice? Um, is Cooley Field. You know, from, from the highway department, which has been working on our programs, they would prefer their location, but you've got all of these wetlands and setback issues regarding wells and stuff, because it would be convenient for them to be able to put that behind their facility. But without a sewer, without that connection there, they can't do anything because of the septic system that puts the property behind there. So again, we come back to what do we own? Cooley, or is there another property that you guys can find? We looked at the gravel pit. Um, Dave didn't want to do that. Part of it maybe wasn't just the wetlands and the tightness of the road, but the fact that it's currently grandfathered. And if we got into selecting that as a future site, would that negatively impact the grandfathering that the DEP has given up on that property? So to do the transfer station again, we have to pick a piece of property. So we either have to buy it or we have to select one if we're going to have a plan. Yeah, I'm strenuously mm -hmm. to the highway department, so I, I just don't think we want to dump in a residential neighborhood. So I don't want to the transfer station. Um, mm -hmm. My personal opinion, but well, Cooley has wetlands issues also. I mean, that's under the Conservation Commission anyway. So. Okay. Um, and access for it. Uh, with the bridge there and everything might not be okay. the best. But without a piece of property, no, I we cannot give you a transfer station plan. That, I think I think we all appreciate that. I, I think the what we need though, um, and I think the committee's done a great job so far, um, is documenting all of these steps that were taken, why they were eliminated, or what the cost would be, so that a year from now we're gonna have to start negotiations if we're gonna continue. We can have for the public um, a very, basically a breakdown on these are the options and these are, this is why we've either accepted or eliminated them mm -hmm. um, so that we have something hard not to say well we we can't find a place or you know um, documenting everything you've done I guess basically and what your cost estimates are and, or maybe even look into purchase property even though it's probably not economically feasible let's document that so that we have that answer in case someone says well did you look at that we, and say, well, no, that's, that's my thought. Okay. Well, what I would say, though, is in one way, shape, or form, everything <clears throat> is documented. At the website, we have published, we had 17 meetings in the first year. Mm -hmm. We've published the minutes to all those. If we did trip reports, they are addendums to that, and they're listed as such as addendums, maps of properties. So everything that we've actually done in terms of what we've discussed we've done that there so i guess what you're saying is in the next report to the committee you know consolidate all that what you want is you want then a simpler summary but the real dilemma becomes if you don't have a piece of property then transfer station is no option for the next negotiation okay if we don't we can't do it i mean we we could say okay we're going to pick this property but then you've got to spend money because we've got to do the engineering study, lay out the map, lay everything out in detail there, and then try to put cost to that, knowing that if we don't pick that, we then have to pick another piece of property and spend that sure. money again. Or, or if it's not, it turns out that it's not suitable after all this stuff. So, but I certainly think that needs to be said. Um, again, in a, in a form that's you know, easily um, put out there. Okay, and, uh, you want it summarized. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You want to, okay. So that will be next year's. Sure. And I'm just speaking for myself. I don't know if you. That will be. Sure. 
okay? But what I would say, maybe it's not in simple format, however, I mean, I under, it is there, though. under the tutelage in, in this document, it's not just in the minutes, in this document on March 23rd, it may not be laid out in bullet form, mm -hmm. okay? But all of that detail about costs and everything is in the March 23rd document, a four-page document that you would have to read. I think you want it laid out, I guess, more in terms of a business plan format. Well, what, assuming or something. We can't very well go to town meeting and say, go read the minutes to see why we didn't choose these options. Yeah. That's not feasible. We well, have to have a document that says, look, this is what we've looked at. You know, we've, we've looked at Yoke with other communities. This is the results. We've looked at purchasing land. This is the result. We've looked at existing property. This is the result. <coughs> to eliminate all these options or I'm not saying eliminate because maybe maybe some of them will work, but at least explore every option and be able to tell the public this is what we've done, and this is why okay. we so, think or the committee thinks this is the best offer. So you're looking for something okay. that more for the public rather than us. Well, uh, both, I think. But yeah, I mean, okay. The board's going to have to whoever the board is going to have to sell it to the to the town yep. if we're going to well, go with another contract. I'll call it a business plan then, a different kind of summary of what we've done because. Basically, I think we've answered both of those questions, but I think, Mark, you're going to be meeting with other town officials, you and Chris, about the possibility of yoking with another district where you might be able to use their facilities or well, not, because that's an option that under the current guidelines we can't right. explore. Jay went out, made some initial contacts, but since he has no authority, the committee has no authority, we can't try to push anything yeah. forward. But that's something that that should be investigated because if you look at the plan here, I have I have the bullets here of the five options. Yep. So there's really still only five options, you know, and we can still address those, but we really want to focus on these other elements here. So well, Matt, have you guys looked into a solid waste district? Into what? A solid waste district. Forming a district with other ten? No, because we don't think that we have the authority to do that. If we have, we the started to we started to look into Ludlow, and that's when. Well, yeah, and it, Chris called I think last week. Right? Yeah, and uh, <laughs> just say it's very hard to get through to uh, the guy that we're calling. Well, well, because what I'm saying here is that the committee's worked hard. The guys have invested a lot of time. Um, they uh, extra hours where we can do that kind of thing and we really we really understand the process well so the question is if you want to give us limited authority to push things forward guys will go out in their own time try to push that but we need not to not necessarily push it get the information yes. that's needed to get everything to set up right, right. I, mean, but I think we, that the, this is, okay. the committee is very capable of doing that investigation with another uh, community in terms of yoking, the the amount of education that this that the committee has received in this process, and I think you've seen the thoroughness of what they've done, and the commitment is incredible. I think they have the the expertise. I think they have the knowledge, and I have the and they have the wherewithal to begin those discussions. Um, on what that might look like and then come back to the board. I mean, we haven't done that yet, so maybe we should give it to the, to the committee and let them do that because they are more than capable. I have no problem with that. I mean, yeah. you're not entering into agreement, you're just right. exploring possibilities. Exactly. So, well, you're, you're on the committee, right? Yep. You're, as a member of the board, can we certainly empower her to represent us in speaking with other towns? Well, well we're, why can't we're we? Talk to I mean, well, I guess that's, I, is one of the I don't know. Well, I'm here. not talking about the towns. I'd be talking about like, I mean, I think when Jay went to Ludlow. Yeah, Jay, you want to answer in terms of what you've done? Well, I was more concerned with like when Jay went to Ludlow, they didn't want to talk to Jay. They wanted to talk to the select board. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, in uh, Ludlow, the DPW, they're all elected officials there. Okay. And JT Goucher heads up the uh, DPW. So he can't make decisions without going before his board. So he'd want to sit down and see how he can help you. Is it within his realms to help you on what he has available to him? Then he has to go before his board if he agrees to it and then get their permission. Um, 
But there's other places we could go to Amherst or something like that and inquire, is your uh, transfer station that you have, is it being underutilized? Uh, would you be willing to accept a partnership with Granby? It's questions that can be asked. Like when I did uh, Longmeadow and um, Ludlow, not only did the, the trip reports are there for you all to read, but we have pictures of everything and how they got set up. And the people were so nice, they even told us on their lesson learned, if I had to build this again, I do it this way. So we have all that information for you, but we cannot commit the town to anything, money or obligations or anything. So that's when we brought it to the select board back in, um, I think it was November or December, and it was decided to be put off until January, if I remember the meeting minutes, and then it was pushed off even farther, and I know we've had a couple conversations back and forth, you know, and it still goes, if you want me to go with you, or Chris, or whoever, as long as I'm not scared to do anything that day, I'd be more than happy to go, but I mean, other people on the committee I feel are, you know, just as well as I am. It's just that being retired, I have a lot of time. You know, versus the other people that have to work. So it's easier for me to go out and collect the information, take the pictures, do the presentations, develop it, and then give it to the committee, and they in turn yay and nay it and send it up to you guys. What I would see the advisory committee in terms of collecting information and stuff yes i would say that would be something that would be appropriate right but how do we facilitate meetings between chris and yourself and these other people because if we're going to talk about it ultimately that's what they would want so how do we do that do we have the authority to do that and if someone let's say jay who's already been involved in this will you know carries on with that you know, maybe you guys share your cell numbers or something, communicate so that he can get something scheduled. It doesn't just have to be a town meeting, but some kind of preliminary meeting. I don't know what your flexibility is, but some kind of preliminary meeting so we can at least explore this and have it either still on the table or off the table before the end of this year because I don't see how it's going to take a long time to ultimately make a decision They'll say yes or no. Yep. We're going to be willing to sell stickers to your residents, you know, and hopefully maybe there's an option of not just one town because maybe people on one side of town would want to go to Amherst if they decide to do it, and people on the other side of town would want to go to Ludlow. You know, to me, those are the two closest locations to be able to do some yoking of anything like that. And then we would see how many residents, would, you know, would go for there, if they're even willing to go for that. Because you mentioned a district. What is your vision of the district? Well, solid waste district, I think that's actually something maybe Arlene could answer better than I could. Solid waste district? Yes. Right Can you tell people what it is? Well, the solid waste, in, in Western Massachusetts, there are three or four actual solid waste districts. And that's where a group of towns, usually small communities, get together. They pay a fee to an administrator, and that administrator manages their helps manage their transfer stations, their contracts, their recycling contracts, those, those sorts of things. There are, there's no solid waste district, but the, the closest one to you is the Franklin County yeah. Solid Waste District. Um, and I think the closest community to you that's a member of that district is probably Leverett. But that's sort of, that's 21 communities up there in Franklin County, there's a hill town, Huntington, Cummington, those towns um, are all part of the district, and then there's Northern Berkshire, and then there's one South Berkshire County. Um, in, uh, right around you, however, each of the communities that abut you have more mature um, solid waste programs with either transfer station and or curbside collection. So I, I don't know that they would be we're able to join such a, such a it's a political entity. Yep. Uh, 
but it's it's certainly you can have a conversation. It would that would not happen overnight. Yeah, my thought was that, and I don't know if this is feasible, but that you know, if we got a bunch of communities got together, whether they could um, negotiate for a better contract with curbside. Right, and we've done we've done some quasi things like that, uh, and I think I love I personally like that idea. Uh, Long Meadow, East Long Meadow did a contract together. Yep. Uh, some haulers will tell you it's advantageous, others will say it's not. Uh, you do have uh, some towns that have curbside programs actually right around you. And that's certainly a conversation that can be had. You'd have to get on your, your cycle, your contract cycle, yeah. in order to be. Um, but yeah, no, that's, that's, that's conceivable. But that's still, it's still similar it's, to what you have. Yeah. It wouldn't be much different from what you had. It might be a little bit of a financial benefit because the more houses you're selling to the hauler, the better the pricing would be per house. But that's certainly feasible. That's, that's, that's easy to ask if you're willing and they're willing to combine. But that, if that's what you mean. That's, that's what I'm thinking. That's not difficult. It's probably, it'll probably be like four years out. Well, I don't know. Uh, South Hadley's on a three-year rotation, and I think Ludlow is too. Those would be the two I'd be thinking of. Uh, Belchertown has uh, got a transfer station. Amherst has private haulers and a transfer station. So those are, those are your butters, right? Yeah, much. Belchertown has private haulers too. They have private haulers, but, they're, but their service station. that they offer is a transfer yep. station. Yes, 45% or, or so of the community uses private haulers, but they're still a transfer station community. Yep. Where Amherst is more private, with three private haulers and transfer station, most of the people use private haulers, some use the transfer station. Uh, South Hadley and Ludlow are per just like you guys are, very similar. In fact, same, no, South Hadley is the same haul. And is a different home. Is South Hadley's landfill closed now? Yes, it is. So anyway, that's the kind of, that's the kind of thing I was looking at. Um, that, that may not be on your time frame. That's the, the only complication I see. Yeah. You have two more years on your contract. South Hadley might, might, might match up with the South Hadley. Okay, but we could certainly... That's that. simple. That's, that's a matter of... Being in the right, having the timing. Yeah. Yeah, well, we could certainly reach out to the committees for those towns and see what they're doing to at least request that with the local towns. Well, and that might be something if we're we'll get negotiating a new contract. Well, we might instead of going with the three year, we might look at two year and then coincide with another town. So we will definitely. That's exactly very simple. Right. Yeah. Right. You get on the same. Get on the same yeah. side. Yeah. If, if you wanted me to check with those communities in that regard, I'm happy to plan. If that's a few. You know, and again, the committee, for the most part, well, certainly I, as head of the committee, for sure, I don't have everybody's vote, yay or nay, but in general, we believe that, that um, you know, that the funding of the program through the tax base is the best because it gives you the buying power. Because if somebody came in, if you've got 57 miles of a road, and we basically have 2200 households or units being covered by that roughly okay if you start breaking it up maybe it's not as economically advantageous at least my contact at republic said that that given that commitment for the whole town that made a difference in the pricing and sure. and my assumption that it does that if you give people a choice of three because we don't have the population density of other communities we don't feel that we're going to get the economies of scale to actually create a beneficial rate for the townspeople. You know, yes, somebody's always going to be upset or complain about what's going on here. But at the same time, uh, Republic is only collecting on units up to three households per building. The apartment complexes are not being covered, and some of the other businesses are not being basically covered, covered by that. So, uh, so I did do a review of that with them. Okay, so uh, so just getting back to Arlene's question, is it are, is the board giving Arlene uh, through the committee uh, permission to go ahead and well, ask say, those questions? I'd say we're delegating that to the committee. Was, um, to the committee okay. and then the committee can handle it. And 
Sure. Or use Arlene to help us yeah. Yeah. Sure. 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 Yeah. To, to facilitate that. Yeah. Okay. And then in terms of like other things, if you got to meet with town officials, I mean, first of all, you have you know Mary to, to count on first. Um, that, I guess that's what I would do. Is I, was, I would start with Mary. I don't mean to throw everything on you, but um, you know, if you want to pass it on to somebody else, that's fine too. But I'm saying in terms of when it comes time to select board to talk to select board, town administrator, town administrator, that would get passed up. And okay. So uh, before closing, I just have a couple of other quick things. So if you want to pass that down. So for the fall schedule, because again, you know, we took the initiative and we created what we call these gap programs, the yard waste. So these are ads. So, so the first page is the uh, hazardous waste ad. Again, uh, Chris, you would have gotten that $3,500 in funding from last year's fiscal year from Republic and that's funds due to defray the cost which will be paid to the town of South Hadley. They're the host community. Um, in addition to these ads, again, they'll be inserted in the senior newsletter at the appropriate time for the appropriate month. Uh, also, there's a page there with the announcements that go into the telephone, into the uh, Odd Communications telephone bill. So there will be the hazardous waste will be in September, yard waste in October and November. That's already set up. Uh, that will be going into the cable TV channels. And then the last thing that you have to approve is robocalls. Okay. So basically, uh, although I alerted um, uh, Alan, um, you know, the approval still has to come from you guys in terms of, of doing robocalls. So I don't know if I need to send the memo back out stating this is about the time we want to do it or what, but that's a book that has to come from you. And then I guess Chris communicates to Alan or whatever your chain of command is in terms of communicating that it's okay to go forward. Alan's already got the messages created. He's just got to change the date so it's the same dialogue. And then we just need a new announcement for the hazardous waste, which we would like to either be made on September 8th or 9th since uh, uh, Gene will be um, uh, doing a pre-registration for the town and that starts September 9th on hazardous waste, which is treated differently than just you know, bringing your, your grass or your, or your brush. So that's something that you have to do for us or decide not to do that. But certainly- Could we do that so that it's not hanging out there? Could we do that today? Yeah. Yeah. I gotta say, I'm not fair of the robocalls. We talked about this with Al before. I've gotten complaints about, not this specifically, but I've had people say, you know, I got this for trash. It's like, you know, um, and I'd rather preserve it for, uh, you know, emergencies. I Maybe, thought you know. Al was going to create a separate database for anybody who wanted to be involved in non emergency out. calls. Well, yeah, he said if they didn't want to receive it, he well, would not make the call the yeah. next time. Then so I think that those are being flagged. I think he's working on If that's being worked on, then that's great. Okay. And then I would just say, go ahead. But certainly, <laughs> for sure, this thing needs it because we haven't done hazardous waste in 18 months. So it's better we get that off than, than start to dump that kind of stuff on the highways or whatever. <coughs> so, you know, we're, we want to make sure that, that uh, I mean, we'd like everything effectively communicated, but really everybody needs to know about it know about this so we can I would say if Al's starting to work on that or take care of it then I'm fine with it. So, okay. Um, so does it does um, do you want me to communicate to Al and who do I CC? Chris? Pardon? Chris will let Al know. Okay. Okay. And then just and, you know just so I know one way or another what's going to be going on there. So that's basically the ads. And then the last thing is this new assistance uh, grant that would also hire Arlene again. Um, there's no paperwork on that there, but basically there's this uh, assistance grant for which uh, the DEP would pay for Arlene's time, and they have limited programs, and this year they're allowed to submit one program, one project, and they're only going to select four projects from all of the towns. And so there's some limited uh, choices. And so, you know, the focus again is recycling or the smart assistance programs on the, you know, where you pay fees for bags. We've done that. 
So one of the things that we wanted to look at would be to implement some kind of basic recycling program within the school system. Or oh, really to start the conversations. I mean, it would yeah. be the I mean, conversations I mean, I, with the school. Right. I have reached out. I don't have a response back from Judith, the superintendent of schools, but I've reached out to her, advised her that we have this option. You know, and then Arlene would work with them and each school would assign something. And it would probably be good that we get a program going if we get the funding, mainly because the kind of environmental things that are going to come down in the future because, you know, in the future there may become, you know, some kind of requirements in terms of how we deal with our organic waste mm -hmm. in schools. And that's, you know, that's a push right now. You know, they've got people, the advanced guys going out and getting funding for all of these special kinds of of, we, of plants and facilities. We looked at that with our uh, on the school building committee. Yeah. That was actually one of the things they asked us about when we're doing the grounds because we weren't going to design one, I think, but we're going to have space for it because it's something we anticipated. So that's something that's coming down the pipe. So on this grant thing, I'm going to be working with her. We have to write four sections, and just like on everything else, our committee's commitment is to do the write up and get everything out to Chris and notes so he doesn't have to looking up anything or think about that. And he can just plug that stuff in and so it becomes efficient instead of him having to go off and then say, oh, you know, there's a competition for time because if he's got to look it all up, maybe it takes him one or two hours where in our case, you know, we can get that done and he can take 15 or 20 minutes, whatever it takes to, you know, to submit the grant itself. So, so that's part of our commitment is to try to find funding, do the upfront lifting and paperwork, and then, you know, and then let Chris do the correct procedure of submitting it himself, so. Do the school have a program already like that? With that well, I know we did no. years ago, that's, but that's it's gone by the way. So yeah, but they did have a program right there. Yes. And what, what happened? happened? Uh, what happened was is, it got to the point where Red Fire Farm couldn't handle it, the amount of volume that they were giving them. So the program basically went by the wayside. And there was no other farm that was willing to step up and take over, yeah. accepting that waste. That, that was one part of it, getting rid of the, the food and the okay. kind of containers that There's you utensil, buy, utensils, and, uh, utensils and, uh, were all so biodegradable. So and brought there. Um, I think what you know, what other options are going to be available are yet to be discussed, really. So, and that would be in cooperation in conjunction with the superintendent. So, I'm sure it wouldn't be to the level initially as what was in effect ten years ago, for sure. Right. And so, any program again, the grant would be for to pay Arlene for her time to then work with them, help us set up an effective program and get that rolling. And obviously a school would have to assign a person, one or two people at each at each building to make sure that they're, the basics are being done based on the program. So, okay. So, so we are right with that as a board to, to go ahead. So what you're interested in is the school Well, that's, exactly. yeah. I mean, we have limited choices. So we think that that would be the best choice. Also looking to the path that if we've got something in place, then when we have to, when we're mandated to deal with the organic waste in a different way, they already have another program set up, so now it's just like plugging in what do we have to do for the organic waste. That's the basic idea because we believe that's coming down the path mm -hmm. in the next couple of years based on yeah, you know, the kinds of conversations that go on at these deep. Did the governor Patrick centers. come up, didn't they have some kind of program for that? Oh, some wow. perspectives for organic waste and but this, the state has, uh, Mass DP has, has a regulation that make, adds organic waste to the waste ban, but only for large institutions. It hasn't come down to the level of your school system in your town yet. And what Joe is suggesting is that as the infrastructure matures throughout the state, that that may come down to level. I'm not sure that's the case. But what I, what I am sure of is as the infrastructure matures, it's going to make it more convenient and more cost effective to take that material out of your waste stream, and that's just going to be more cost effective for you as a community. My friend lives in Montreal, they actually have that. That may be. I was astounded. I was yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, and one last thing uh, that I just thought about this I met with Jean from Board of Health 
uh, after she met last week with Veronique from South Hadley about the hazardous waste day. And uh, Jean is also going to be talking to the school and the highway department about what hazardous waste do they have that they want to get rid of or for the school, can the highway department help haul all of that over? You know, so part of the idea is, you know, we haven't really collected any hazardous waste now in at least 18 months now for the town. And so there's got to be a buildup here unless we have another channel in the way that we get rid of that. So we want to make sure that those departments take advantage of that too. And again, we've got that $3,500 provided by Republic towards towards this program. So so hopefully, you know, all of that should basically cover it unless the highway or school comes up with an unbelievable amount of hazardous waste. So, but but the school system should take advantage of that. All right. So as long as you get the school on board. Yeah. Okay. On board. Yeah. So I'm just reaching out to the super to yeah. do that. So so before I close, um, John or Jay, you guys want to say anything? I'm all set. Jay's been working so hard. He's only got one arm now. Oh, yeah. well, Mary keeps me in line. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, I just want to say that I want to thank the committee. It's been one of the most rewarding committees that I've been on since I've been a select board member. It's, it's shown true involvement by our citizens, um, an enormous amount of work and time, and they're just so devoted to, to making it work. And they're thorough and accountable, and who could ask for anything more? So I, I, I can't thank you enough and as a select board member, but as a participant in the committee, it's it's truly enriching to see this kind of committee operate in town. So I thank you very, very much. And and again, definitely thank Arlene. Um, Arlene really is the expert, and she's helped make things a lot easier for us. So, so yes, I, I apologize for awesome. leaving you alone. All right. Well, thank okay. You. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, guys. Are you guys going to press? What's that? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Rick, you guys um, were done a long time ago. Yeah, we got the wrong time from our golf side. Oh, uh, okay. Especially government network. Okay. Uh, do you have any Girl Scout cookies? I don't know if you're selling anything. Thank you, Joe. Yep. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Joe. Joe. Thanks, guys. All right. Um, motion to accept departmental reports. A motion that we accept the departmental reports as written. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion that we approve the maintenance warrants uh, number 79, number 81, number 16, and number 4, 5, and 6. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We have um, appointment to the COA Board of Directors, and he's, um, Jessica Scahill has brought forth two names, Lillian Mu and Lisa Anderson. Um, make a motion that we accept the recommendations for these two board members. Second. All right, good people. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. The, the members would serve for a term of three years. You got Fatma for number four? What's that? She's got Fatma for number four. For yeah. four. Something at you up to sign. Oh, I can't hardly wait. Is that in here too? That's right. Next one. That's right. Okay. I'm down. And I think it's got four yeah. letters. So it's nice. Yeah. Let me explain what that is. Yeah, please, Chris. So item number four is the Federal Highway Association Administration. Remember the nice big snowstorm we had about three years ago in October? Yeah, that, very well. Uh, took us a while to clean up that yeah. did a good job cleaning up. Well, some of those roads were Federal Highway Administration roads. We applied for money through the state to get reimbursement. However, before we can get reimbursement, we have to sign this non-discrimination assurance form 
that says that we don't discriminate against anybody on any type of any level, type of race, creed, whatever. Protected status. Yeah, and uh, so the chairman of the board is required to sign that. Once he signs that, then there will be another form that we can say has been completed in our quest. Our to receive three years, three years, years yeah. to receive the federal reimbursement for monies expended on cleaning the federal highway roads back in October 2011, I think it was. Is it the 19th or 20th? Today's the 20th. Today's the 20th. <coughs> Would you need? Just he's signing yeah, it. That's it. That's no it. motion or anything. You can authorize him to sign it if the board so desires. Uh, you can look through the rest of the I think I got the signature part down. Okay. Closing of streets. Uh, Dave DeRosier for this summer's Chapter 90 work is looking at doing work on Easton and Bachelor Street and on Pleasant Street between East and 202, Route 202. Um, he is currently working on Easton and Bachelor. Basically, what that's going to be is he's putting in culverts on Easton Street. I believe he's also widening, widening the road also. Uh, Bachelor Street is going to be an overlay project. And on Pleasant Street, it's going to be an in-place recycling project, asphalt recycling project. So he's looking to have the roads closed due to construction, pass at your own risk type of thing. For Easton and Bachelor between July 20th and October 1, and for Pleasant Street between August 1st and October 1st. Motion to close those streets. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Do we have to do any notifications to anybody? The signs are up, I can tell you now. Mm, no. No, he usually clears it with all the emergency personnel. And well, the roads will be open to traffic, but we don't have to notify anybody that legally they're closed. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, evaluation. There we go. Yeah. All right, that's not a good one. All right, so what I'll do is I will run through the uh, different um, categories. Number one is personal characteristics. And I would say that we gave Chris a average of 3.2. We gave him a average of 3.6. Mary a 2.2 for an average of three. Number two, professionalism. I gave Chris a 3.5. We gave him a 3.5. Mary gave him a 2.75 for an average of 3.25. Public relations. I gave Chris a three. We gave him a 3.5. Mary gave him a 1.75 for an average of 2.75. Uh, number four, uh, board support relations. I gave Chris a three. Um, we gave him a 4.4, and I gave him a 2.8 for an average of 3.4. Community leadership. I gave Chris a three. We gave him a 3.2, Mary gave him a two for an average of 2.73. Uh, personnel management, I gave Chris a 3, we gave him a 3.4, we gave him a 2.5, for an average of 2.96. Organizational management, I gave Chris a 3.6 average, um, blue a 4.2, married a 2.6, for an average of 3.46. Financial, financial management, I gave Chris a 3.8, we gave him a 4.5, and married him a 3.5, for an average of 3.93. Uh, town management infrastructure, I gave Chris a three. 
We'll give him a 3.25, Mary gave him a 2.25, and now a 2.83. For planning organization, we gave Chris a 3.2, we gave him a 3.2, and Mary a 2.4 for now a 2.93. Right. Overall rating came out to be, um, or average rating, what's the difference? Okay. I put down two ratings. The average rating was the total of everybody's ratings average. Um, for my average, it came out to be a 3.23. Uh, Louis uh, a 3.79. Mary a 2.51 for a 3.57 average for average rating. Overall rating, um, I gave Chris a 3.23. Lou gave Chris a 3.79. And I, Mary gave him a 2 for a total of Overall rating of 3.18. Can you explain what the different ratings indicate, Mark, so that people know what what scale we're using? Oh, uh, like for the number, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, it's a rating scale of one to five. Uh, a one is uh, unsatisfactory, a two is improvement needed, three is meets job standards, and a four exceeds job standards, five is outstanding. Um, so personal characteristics, I'm not gonna go through every single one, but just uh, honest and ethical behavior, fair and equitable, deals with unforeseen issues and problems, resilience, creative solutions, professionalism, uh, knowledge in the field, uh, taking advantage of educational opportunities, participating in municipal management organizations, uh, public relations, positive image of the community, uh, open to the public, communicate effectively with the media, keep citizenry informed of current issues, um, board support and relations, quality analysis of analysis, implementing board policies and other directives, handling routine requests, keeping board members informed of issues and activities um, in town and government, town government and community, listening to select board concerns, community leadership, uh, providing leadership in the community by being visible, maintaining good communications with the business community, support and recognize the efforts of volunteer citizens and groups, maintaining effective communications with other community, communities, effective communications with state and federal uh, elected positions and whatnot, organizational leadership, uh, Leadership, motivation, support within the organization, delegating tasks, building, a motivating a team, providing direction, including selecting personnel, uh, have the respective department heads. Personnel management, um, evaluates performance, takes necessary actions to resolve negative results, effectively delegates tasks and assignments, provides leadership and negotiating labor, con uh, labor contracts, positive employee relations, developing man personnel management system, Financial management, timely realistic budget, maximizing current op review opportunities through non-tax mechanisms like grants. Controlling town expenditures, ensuring controls on town activities, forecasting the town's financial condition. Operations and infrastructure is number nine, and that's effective oversight and coordination of town programs and services. Seeks to improve town infrastructure, enhance municipal services and delivery, uh, promotes automation and that's the robots and innovation planning an organization creates a, facilitates a, an environment for long-range and strategic planning proposals for cost-effective reorganization of town operations establishes appropriate goals and objectives for performance negotiates and keeps realistic commitments manages expectations of others and that's about it So I can send a copy of that and my scratch sheet uh, to you, Lou, and Kathy Leonard, who's not here today. So from this, again, we, um, you develop goals, Chris, right? Based on an evaluation. Is that how we have been no. doing it? So We've actually talked about developing goals. One of the ones was uh, public-private partnerships. One of the ones that he's going to be working on, so he'll be coming back with those. And when would that be? Yeah, probably could do it next meeting.
When's next one? The August, August, August 3rd. 2nd, 3rd? Yeah. Something like that. 3rd. The other thing is uh, when they do a job description for Chris and they want to look at changing some of the things in that, we want his um, evaluation to probably reflect that job description that that guy comes up with. So. Right? Thanks for going to the the MMA this year. I think it I think it's a very good thing to go to for the town administrator. I think um, I hope that you found that it was, but I know you said you didn't come back with the same thing you came back with a few several years ago when yeah. you came back with the insurance from Maya, but um, I don't know. I think it's it's a great thing that you went, so thank you for doing that. It's just her picking the topics to go to, too. Yeah. They, they run them concurrently, so sometimes it's just hard to, you want to split yourself in two sometimes. <clears throat> well, I appreciate you going. Thank you. All right. What, do you have, what else do we have, Chris? Um, I've got basically three items. Uh, we are currently using uh, the building commissioner from South Valley as our interim building inspector. Uh, however, in order for the person to be able to act officially on behalf of the town of Granby, we need to appoint her as an interim building inspector. Uh, I'd like to appoint her for the term to go to at least December 31st, just to give us enough time um, to either decide if we're going to share services with South Hadley enter into a memorandum of agreement with them or try and hire our own or do whatever. So I'd like to ask the board to affirm Charlene Bayardi as the interim building inspector for the town of Granby from effective July, I'm gonna say July 1 through December 31st. Will we get to meet her? At yes, I'll, bring, I'll ask her to come in to the next meeting. And so she's been doing it right now, right? I, she started last week. She comes in, holds office hours on Thursday mornings between 8 and 12. And she was kind enough to also come in this afternoon and tonight to catch up on the backlog of permits. So, um, yes, we are. They are contacting her at South Hadley. They can call her there to get uh, talk to her, present their building permits, get approvals, and. We're trying to help her with as much paperwork as possible in this. So in the meantime, will we be advertising? I do have an ad out for a building commissioner. I won't call it building inspector. I think they'd like the word commissioner now. Need some more money. Um, <laughs> well, the state requires certification to do it, so I think that's why they like the word commissioner instead. Uh, I do have it out in the Daily Hampshire Gazette. However, we are going to be looking at, I'm trying to get the contact information for the building officials of Western Mass to be able to get it out to them and get it out there to all the building officials of yeah. Western Mass. Now we have, we have a resume in hand, correct? Are we going to do anything with that in the meantime or just to, why not? I would say we'd wait and interview everybody at once. So ha have we, made that known to the person who submitted? Have we followed up with that? That was, that was given to us before we even, the first one even resigned, so. And that that was a, a suggestion from the former building inspector of a person who get to come in and replace I still would like to talk to her at some point in time. However, you know, I just want to see what the advertising shakes out at the same time. That's Is it possible just to make Mm -hmm. Contact with her and say that that's what we're doing. Okay. Will okay. you do that, Chris? Yep. Okay. So, do I have a motion to affirm, affirm. affirm her appointment from July 1 to? Second. Is there a motion? <laughs> yes, I'll move okay. to appoint Charlene. Right. Priority. Priority. Um, July 1st, December 31st. Yep. All right. All those uh, in favor? Aye. Hi. Um, at the couple meetings back, we have filled out an application for community Commonwealth Community Compact. The three items that we wanted to deal with: one was financial, one was energy, and I forget what the third one was. 
of an infrastructure, maybe. If that was one of the or economic development. I think it would maybe been economic development. Uh, I have heard, even though we don't have a contract with the Commonwealth at this point in time, I have heard back from the DOR and the DOER, and they've been talking about our needs, and we are trying to set some stuff up in place to address at least the financial and the energy part. So two of the three are also are currently being addressed by state agencies, and myself have been contacting me. So. Uh, and at a prior meeting, we had mentioned how Mr. Barry and myself have met with a select board member and the town administrator in South Hadley. Uh, I had received a communication from the town administrator about a letter he had received from District 2 regarding the outcome of the meeting that we had with them and they then presented to D2. They seem to agree that with the items we had put forth in our letter to them. Uh, and we may want to start looking at trying to negotiate an MOA with D2 regarding that section of town regarding the provision of services. Now that letter, we have that letter. I forwarded it to you in the email. I don't have the official letter. All I got it was as an email. Oh no, I got their D2 letter, but the letter that, that we sent from here well, you said you said they responded to a right. We do have, I have that? I I, I look you back. Might have, but if you want, I'll forward it. Over what, could you do that? Yeah. Basically, summarize what we discussed with them that day. Um, the points that we have been talking about all along. Now, is that is that something that you can discuss here? I suppose we can. Yeah, yeah, why not? I mean, so um, the there was basically four points. Four bullet points that we were talking about. One had to do with inspections and permitting. Uh, we had stated that we had no issue if District 2 did all the inspections and permitting for structures there. Bullet point two was that we felt that the town of Granby's fire chief retained all forest warden uh, activities. In the, in the area. Item three is we expected dual response from both Granby and D2 fire apparatus in that area of town. And then whatever it was determined, if it was in the town of Granby area, Granby would become in charge. Or if it was a D2 area, then Granby would go, go home. Or stay, or asked. stay if asked, if if necessary. D two D two would call the shots if it was in. D2. Right, and then the third one was is, or the fourth one was is that D two would install, or provide, install and maintain radio equipment in the police dispatch area so that we could effectively do dual dispatching. Subject to Chief Wishart's right requirement. Uh, but they would be responsible for all payment maintenance and all that. Yes. If any equipment's required. Yes. Those are the four topics we basically talked about. So the dual response, just explain that again to me. Okay, dual responses. Now I know what it is, but when they get there, they both go. Right, now, because when someone's calling in that they saw a fire on Amherst yeah. Road, we don't know if it's within the district boundaries or outside the district boundaries. So what, what we're trying to do is to say, tone out both departments. When they get to the area where the fire is, then if it's in District 2 boundaries, District 2 becomes the Even though it's a Granby charge. resident. Even though it's a Granby resident, District 2 is in charge of the scene. They would determine whether they wanted Granby to stay or for Granby to sign off and go back to the station. If it's not within District 2 boundaries, then the Town of Granby Fire Department would be the lead department on it. They would determine whether they needed D2 to stay to a system or to, for them to go back to their station. Basically, it's what they've been doing since the 50s, with the exception of South Hadley taking over inspections where it used to be Granby, but they certainly have a valid argument that if they're the fire department, which they apparently are, 
then they should should be doing the inspection also. And our attorney also told us, I mean, the three concerns I look out for were one, the health and safety of the people, right. Grandview residents and district two, two, any liability that the town would incur. Actually, those are really the only two things that we had to look for. Um, but the attorney said that, you know, you really don't need inspections. It would make more sense. It would keep it cleaner if South Island is doing the inspection. So we have, um, yeah, basically they're respecting the things that we have to have by, um, you know, advice of attorney. If we had agreed to something that our attorney didn't recommend, we'd really open ourselves up for lawsuits. Seems to be that there's progress. At this, at this juncture, there seems to be progress. Um, or we'll see how well the negotiations go and developing the MOA, the actual document. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't address the, the taxation issue, which is what our citizens originally had the biggest problem with. But I, I think we pretty much understand there isn't much we can do about that. We but tried that route by doing the home rule petition, and we were told by the subcommittee that it would never come out of subcommittee. By the legislature. By the legislature, right. So. There's, yeah, there's just. There's no um, no uh, higher authority we have to come from the legislature doing special legislation. And, and there, there's no way we can abate local taxes because it's not one of the legally. We have to have special legislation, get the uh, um, town meeting to agree. And, it's and the issue would end up being, though, is you would see probably other towns with fire districts probably fighting adding on additional abatement procedures just based upon fire taxes. The other thing is our abatement. Tax. I mean, they're... I don't know. It would be minimal because it's a yeah. minimal you know, cost. So my calculation is that fire tax is about 10% of our tax bill. So if you have a $500,000 house, you're paying an extra five hundred or $500,000 house, you're paying an extra what? So $5,000? No. Well, if our... If our if, if, I, I think it's more like 1% of our total taxation. So for, for our fire department. Right. But for theirs. For, but I'm just saying, so on an $18 per thousand tax bill, about 18 cents would be. $180? Whatever. $18. I don't know. But 18 cents would end up being 18 cents on the thousand. What so they're paying for South Hadley District 2 is right. a lot higher than that. Yeah, we have before us so a. A concern by a resident, Michael and Patricia Bombardier on Lynn Drive, received the bill of $480.82. You know, he wants to know. And that, is that the quarterly bill? That's. From the fourth page. Total tax, it says $480.82. I thought there was something there right. about being a quarterly. That's fourth payment. That's one quarter. One quarter. One quarter. It's four hundred. So four times that yep. is his bill. Yes. No wonder he says it's absurd. About nineteen hundred dollars. I, I don't know how we cannot feel badly for these people. We can. We all feel good. <laughs> what can we do about it? I mean, the town spent about twenty thousand dollars trying to get this thing adjudicated. The town. Um, it's just terrible. But this is where uh, history makes life difficult because. Wasn't a single person. You know, we, we, we tried to, what we could do, and we were told no, it's not going to be allowed. So I think the only other thing remedy would be is try, if the board wants to, is see if one of the legislatures wanted to put some sort of an amendment in that makes them subject to Proposition 2 and a half like we are. They're not going to do that for I, fire districts. I, I, I doubt it, but that's the only other option that we could do to try and control the level of increases. That's all. You know, it's just. That's the problem with districts. They're not held to that two and a half like we are. Yeah. There's just, there's no, nothing we can do at this point as a, as a board or as a town. I mean, I wouldn't recommend spending more money on the problem because I don't think it's going to be going anywhere. So are we answering this resident? 
I don't know how to answer it because we're not really doing, we can't do anything. We've tried everything. We've well, legally we tried. That's got to be the answer. Yeah. Sorry. We've legally tried everything. We've, we've, tried. Really, we've tried everything we can do and this. So we have. It's just bomb yeah. right? Yeah. Yep. So you'll call them, Chris? No, I'll call them. Oh, you'll call them? I need to. But, uh, it's just, I mean, their, their best course of action at this point is to get involved in D2. So I'm going to start going to the meetings the down, holding the budget down. I guess that's all you can that's do. That's all they can do. I don't know what else to say beyond that. That's going to be a problem. Yes, I will. That's going to be like, I don't know where they live. They're their problem. It's probably like 10% of their house value. That's the that's the part of the bill that's really high. Well, I'm gonna, does it include the water too? Um, though, Chris, wouldn't it have the amount and then just say unpaid? No, it no, wouldn't. No, because because they issued quarterly bills, so this is the fourth quarterly bill. That's what they, that's all they're saying. And they wouldn't give you the first, second, and Not third. Not necessarily, no. Oh, no. That's weird. Well, I thought 480 was bad. If it's really, it's, it's, hmm. I can't believe that it's that much. The that, only thing I can think of is whether they include yeah. water in that. No, water's water a separate bill. bill. Separate. Water's a separate bill. Is there a house that's like worth a million dollars on one drive? I can't, I can't think of one. Unless they just bill once in the fourth quarter, maybe. Maybe that's the way their tax collector is. Does our tax collector send that up? Yes. Maybe that's just the way she has it. Instead of sending because the average uh, quarterly, she might just send it annually in the fourth quarter. The average tax bill. Yeah, so it would only be four eighty. That's still yeah. a lot of money. Oh, I know it's, but it's not. Mm. It's not. That two what two grand said, seems really high. Four eighty. Yeah. That because the average was four hundred dollars. No, no that was the average fire tax bill was four hundred dollars. Was it? That's what it was last year. So. Um, yeah. yeah. yeah she doesn't have the value. Doesn't still have the value. Five six hundred. There is no value on here either. So. She must bill once a year and probably just bills it's it before the quarter. But it's still high. Uh, it's like a ten percent, uh, like a ten percent thing on your tax. It's like a well, it's quarter. They're on their car and they need a copy of that. Yeah, they're probably their tax bill is probably what two, three thousand pounds, so it's twenty percent of what they're paying us. And it's probably about three to four. Okay, we also. Are we, you're going to take care of that? Yes, I will take care of We have a, a letter um, that Dave sent. Can you, can you just the talk a little bit? Oh, more? that's the DEP? Yeah. Um, currently, the, the highway department for our sewer pump station goes out and does a daily inspection of each of the pump stations we compensate those individuals for their daily inspection we installed a computerized monitoring system called mission a mission system which can perform basically the same functions what david is asking dep is to allow us to be able to reduce the number of daily inspections i think he wants to reduce i think to three or four a week to begin with um, he is basically looking at to reduce the inspections to every other day and providing that the system remain reliability remains unchanged would return to weekly inspections after one year so basically he's going to reduce daily inspections to weekly inspections hopefully after a year's time uh, he's asking the EP to, to allow him to do that to accept the computerized system monitoring system as results as being in lieu of a daily inspection and just go once a week. So that's costing us like fifty dollars a day or something. It's costing us fifty dollars a day. Are we have a contract with that company. Uh, mission, I believe it's just an annual. Uh, that's the station. technology part. That's the technology. Part. So, yeah. have we? No, I'm talking the company that does the inspection. No, we just hire uh, people with certifications. We have four. There's people. no contract. We don't have to worry about saying. No. Always a pleasure. Thanks. 
We have about, uh, I think it's 14 people the inspections from near Boucher Town and places like that, South Athens. And we were going to hopefully put that in the job description of the new person, right? So that we don't have to hire. Yes. They, they are required to have the proper certifications to well, perform, perform that, those inspections, yes. <clears throat> And then there's a letter from all three um, to Mass DOT about the intersection of 202 and Amherst Street and Dunkin' Donuts area. Yeah, that has to do with the proposed uh, moving of Amherst Street from its present location to being closer to Pleasant Street. And Basically, what's being reiterated in those letters is what we told the engineer when they came out with their initial plans that we think it's a bad idea because we already have a traffic issue there at certain times of the day, and moving it closer will only acerbate the issue. And Lou had also mentioned that they had originally <coughs> moved it from that site back to its current site because of traffic issue, what, 20, 30 years ago? Probably 1990-ish. So, yeah, that's the issue that we're running into is that uh, putting it back from where they moved it from. Really. 25 years ago. Yeah. yeah so, I, I actually talked to both Cindy Watson and Kevin Brooks over the past week at different times. I haven't been running to both of them. And they both, their memory of the issue was the same. Of course, Kevin was on conservation back then and Cindy was on the select board when that was done. It was done because there was a safety issue with, with in a traffic issue that was 25 years ago. It was a tra it caused a traffic issue at the corner. So it's certainly not going to be any better now. And all was because Cumberland moves. Yes. And um, now the the, inter the road was coming out in between the two Cumberland entrances, so they moved it directly across from one of the entrances. Now they want to move it directly across the other, which is ludicrous because it's right almost in the intersection plus i think it's removing almost all the parking area for 16 the dozen the, same 16 yeah for the no, dunkin donuts area building itself they're basically taking away the whole parking lot in fact it's almost at the point where it was i don't know when when it was truly a five corner intersection no back in the 60s wasn't it? Uh, I, mean, I don't know i know it was, it was long before i got here but it used it was right into that intersection and they moved it back to where it was in the 80s and then, uh, they, then they went to it again. Um, so it's, it's pr it probably went right through the how, what was the Hallam building. I mean, that was, that had been there quite some time. So yeah. That's why they call it Five Corners. So I think, I don't know, do we want to send a letter to our senator and reps? Did you talk to Eric? I did not talk to Eric. Uh, I was waiting for that letter. Oh, okay. um, I would maybe CC that letter to him. Um, maybe along with a letter from us saying we have really serious concerns about this. Okay. Not only from a safety point, but from the business point of view. I mean, we're, we're taking probably the busiest business as far as traffic goes in town. Eliminating half the parking and the ATM machine. Yep. I don't know where trucks are going to park. Uh, They'll be parking, parking on 202. Or Amherst Street. Yeah. And we have a um, letter from Al Bell uh, saying that he wishes to decline his appointment to the bylaw committee. So do we have another person in mind? Not at this point. No. And he had originally said yes when you asked him. You said. And then we have a letter from uh, Michael Beck to the select board regarding the violation of historical district bylaws appointment procedures. I am writing and representing the current members of the Granby Historic District Commission to inform you the appointments of Stephen Valley and William Johnson do not follow the guidelines of the Granby Historic District bylaws, chapter 20, section two. Specific violations of the bylaw include requesting nominations from only the Granby Historical Association to fill four slots for a resident realtor and two historical 
association slots, failing to request nomination from the Board of Realtors for the expired term of a, of a realtor, receiving two nominations from the GHA and not appointing their selected nominees, but rather selecting two of your own. This will serve as your legal notice of violations committed by you in the office administrator regarding all actions described above. Please give this very important matter the utmost attention. Sincerely, Michael C. Beck, Randy Historical District Chairman, CC Kathy Kelly Regan, Attorney General Healy, and District Attorney C. Um, so I, there must be two issues here. One, we had tabled the appointment of Mike Beck, correct? We are waiting for the nominations from Realtors. And did we receive that? No, he called me and he was putting it out a, I guess an email blast or whatever to their membership to see who it was. So you didn't receive anything no. from the Realtors? No. We got 30 days. Who has 30 days? Realtors to submit their nomination. Okay, so the other, um, the other concerns that he is bringing forth is uh, receiving two nomina nominations from the GHA and not appointing their selected nominees, but rather selecting two of your own. I have sent a letter to GHA because per the bylaw, they're supposed to submit four nominees. They're not meeting until August 4th, and they will be submitting four nominees at that point in time. So what do we do in the meantime about this, I guess? That's a poor decision. My thought is to just re um, basically clear the decks, rescind all the appointments, um, which I was not, the only one I was thinking about was we'd already appointed Lisa uh, Petraglia, but I think according to statute, I've been looking at this stuff a lot, she would continue until she is, um, she would be continued, she would continue until she was appointed or somebody else was appointed or whatever. I'm not trying to get rid of it, we can keep it there if you want to, but, um, but I thought it's just to kind of clear the decks and Chris has calls into um, Ed Ryan and um, I gotta say, I've looked at this bylaw a lot and there are major issues with it, but the issues go all the way to the, they should go all the way to the, the mass general laws. So there's like contradictory stuff there, contradicts other laws, other statutes. Um, so I think it really has to be sorted out by Ed before we actually get to a, a point where we can um, appoint and reappoint. And I don't think that, I hope that that was ready for by next month because we're working on it. So in the meantime, does the existing committee stay put? The existing, if we're rescinding the, the existing appointees. How does that work? If a person is not reappointed, if we're not doing anything with that committee, then doesn't it stay put until basically, yeah, so it stays put? That's what I'm, yeah, without well, being reappointed, yeah, that's what I'm pretty sure it's statute, so. And we also can appoint alternates, correct? Yep. And so, I mean, uh, basically it's, So Each member and alternate shall continue in office after the expiration of his term until his successor his successor is duly appointed and qualified. Yeah. Okay. So, so when did you? I, I'm seeing that this. I, I didn't get this letter until tonight. This certified letter. Just in the future, if I get a certified letter here, if someone could just give me an email, that'd be I'd pick it up. I I didn't even know this was here, so I just opened it. Um, but it's dated June 29th. So when did we call Ed? regarding this from yeah this was email that right mike's letter was emailed out to us wasn't it 
that I way? didn't email it. I don't know. I, it didn't come from me. Okay. Yeah. So, um, when did you call Ed on this? Reach back. I mean, he's on vacation for. Uh, oh, he was on vacation for a week. Yeah. You know, I know him and I have been dealing with it for at least a week and a half now. So. Okay, so he's responding. I know that there was a time that you were concerned that he's not responding, and but he's responded, right? I give him deadlines to respond. Now. Okay. Because that would be important to, again, resolve this. And he said he's been talking with some of his colleagues on how the bylaws are written, how the statutes are written. But until the bylaws are changed, don't we have to follow this? Mm. I mean, bylaws are. Bylaws are, we have to follow, but if the bylaw is not legal in and of itself, then the thing, the thing is, I want to try and get it dealt with while going to court. Um, and I don't mean being sued, but like basically, this bylaw is messed up. Uh, I mean, and it's not. The, the, the problem that Ed is having with the bylaw is in it when they talk about the nominees. It says where possible. And he doesn't, can't figure out what where possible means in the bylaw. And he's been running it by some of his other municipal councils asking them what they think and they're also being stymied by the clause where possible and that's where he's at he's trying to get some indication of what that meant when the bylaw was written the other thing is you can't this is where i have our time and it's it's fairly clear in the statute or similar to the statute um, is you can't force anybody to appoint somebody if you think about it just from a practical standpoint, let's say we have somebody that's presented for a, a nomination. If two of us vote no, that person's not appointed. But if you're supposed to, like, there's nobody, there's not a higher authority that can appoint somebody. So it's there's like a, a legal thing here that's screwy that needs to, somebody. Well, I would think if you follow a bylaw and you choose not to appoint, you would have to do it for just cause just reason so you'd have to I mean uh, if I were the guy person on the other end I mean certainly I would feel it. well I think that's that's where the question of this uh, phrase where possible is I mean um, where possible okay so you should point these people where possible if they exist or they should, you should point those people where possible I mean, what if you God forbid you had a uh, somebody who's under indictment or if you had somebody appointed or nominated who was a convicted felon, do you have to appoint them? No, but it's just cause. I just guess. Reason. Yeah, so that's I where. Could easily, I, I mean, I would definitely say what my reason, that would be my reason but, for voting against it. But we're, we can't, um, that's where the courts and different stuff, not us, because there's different standards. There's, you know, reasonable, not reasonable. Um, not, and then who determines who's, how, what's reasonable and not reasonable. And then, um, no, nobody has a right to be appointed, even if somebody has a right to nominate. So who has standing? So like the Board of Realtors, if we don't address their nominees, they would have standing to conceivably sue us, but nobody has a right to be appointed. You follow me? Oh, I follow you, but I mean, I mean if, just if our past practice has been that we follow the uh, bylaws, well, I think we will follow the bylaw. Yeah. I think we have to wait until we get the nominations for the bylaw. We will follow it. We have to follow it. And then calls for nominations that we haven't gotten yet. So I think it's kind of a little point until we get the nominations. No, I'm just, I'm just for future. Mm -hmm. Lou. Yeah. When we're supposed to get a nomination. If, from GHA, we mm -hmm. get those and we don't we ignore them. Well, we, that's we the different get, thing I think going forward. We only get two. We only get two. I know, but four. Okay, but the bylaw calls for four. So, we, so if keeping with the bylaw, we should have had four nominations. So if we only had two, then in effect they're appointing those two people to the board, which again is a weird thing. Which is why they say two out of four, one out of two. They can't appoint their. They can't appoint nominated. Nominated. But if they, if we have to appoint who they nominate, and they only nominate two, and it's, I'm not talking about these particular individuals because I personally have no problem with either individual, but if they 
give us two names that we have to nominate to, in effect, they're nominated. And that's inconsistent with, with the intent of the bylaw. Uh, but, so I think if we're gonna follow the bylaw, which we should, we, we should follow it all the way. If it says four nominations, we should get four nominations. But it also has to be, it, this, is a, this is true in, you know, not just in bylaws, but regular statutes and stuff like that. You run into situations where the law is not clear. Well, this is the only appointment I'm aware of that we get nominations from outside the board, and it, I think it's probably, I don't think it's ever been followed before. And I mean, when I've looked around the other towns, it seems like the bylaws are the same, and when you look at the statute, the bylaws are very similar. I don't know if anybody's ever, you know, basically tested it, but mm -hmm. I felt, I understand what they do on the school building committee, but it's like, you know, the state tells us we have to appoint X, all these different people um, to this, you know, and a lot of those people aren't taxpayers. And um, in this case, we've got two or three organizations, and there's nothing wrong with those organizations, but they don't represent the electorate. They're not elected, you know, by the townspeople of Granby. So you're basically giving them the ability, if you read this as a nomination is as good as an appointment, you're giving those organizations the authority to appoint people to a position in town, and the people in town have no recourse. It's really, really weird. I, I, and that's where you need a, a lawyer. I'm, I've done enough reading on it just to be able to say that it's weird. But what, I can't really, yeah. Mark, what I think is weird is that this, I, I've been doing nominations for a long time on this board, and we're always looking for people. And we have people that are willing to do the job, and we don't reappoint them. I just cannot fathom it, so I want that noted. Jerry? I would just like to add something to all of this. Um, the GHA, this is only our second round with this bylaw. Um, had we had more time, the first letter that came out, we were really trying to put impartial people, and we did our homework. And, and I understand, you know, you feel pressured to appoint, but if you're only appointing three people out of eight, um, I think that you need to trust us that we're gonna put impartial people that would work well with the committee, and we've really tried to do that. The second letter that came out was just it's distributed to us, the voting people, three days ago. And here we are tonight. Um, I was at the uh, sixth meeting, and because Mary wasn't here, you were going to put the appointments tonight. And I came saying, we just didn't have enough time to look around and, and find someone that would really work well with the committee. Uh, and now I'm hearing we have 30 days. Um, that wasn't in the letter, but w I mean, uh, we're trying to help. We're not trying to. It's not, it, this is, um, if I was looking back at the uh, town of Horse, did we ever even have a full historical district committee or no. did we only have three people no. on there? So I that, was not many, many, I was not on that, but yeah. like many committees, you know, it's really hard to get a full vote. But we are working on it and we are meeting again. We are all working behind the scenes and bringing those nominations to our next meeting so you can have them. We're trying to work in a timely manner. Like I said, this letter that we just got, I have it here. I got it three days ago, the 17th. You know, it, it's hard to do homework in that period of time. But it and we don't want to just July 9th, so. throw any, we, yeah. I know it's dated, I'm just saying our treasurer that. I'm not arguing that, but yeah, I'm just saying it was, just it was mailed out. It three days ago. Uh, we're trying to work and, and put someone good in place. We understand and, that, and yeah. We just need the time to do that. I, ex I expect that you should have the time. Okay. I mean, we're, we're trying to follow this, but it, until we get a ruling from uh, town council, we're not really. Now that we know that and there was a problem in 2013, and that was the first time we ever got involved, and I've been in this uh, group for 20 years, and we never were involved with this. But now that we know this, I mean, we've talked, and we know that come June 1st, we need to give you four nominees. So you'll get that. Now that now that it's on the table and we know that this is going to come up every year, we will have that information for you. Well, it, it shouldn't come up every year because I think your nominees will stay on for a three-year term, right? 
So it will be like every three years that you would be given nominees. They're not staggering? Well, they, no. I don't, I don't think so. When they, they first start, I think. They first start. Staggered. Well, I mean, they're all staggered, but when the, you don't, I don't believe you're going to get a, one person to be appointed for one year, one person appointed for two. I think that's only for the setup okay. of their establishment. Now there, there are other members that expire at different years. But yeah. I think your nominees, I think, would probably, it seems both expire. That's something so. we would have to clarify, too, because, you know. No, it's a, I mean, when I we met with Ed Ryan once, and when he looked at it, he was like, oh, my God, you guys need to work on your bonds. Because <laughs> this is, um, I've been lucky in that other people's and stuff. And they still, like, in terms of the, it's ter in terms of membership of the board, they're still the same. Um, but, like, from a, I don't know, a civic standpoint, I mean, I'm not, there's nothing wrong with the grand B. It's just like, imagine it wasn't you guys. Imagine it was some other historical association, you know, the evil historical association, and we had to do, um, and we had to choose nominees from them. That would be bizarre. You know what I mean? Um, cause, I mean, we're elected, at least theoretically, we can get thrown out of office at the end of the thing, but there's no way that the Board of Realty, Realtors could be held accountable, do you know what I mean? And I don't mean to say that they're doing anything wrong, but it's just really, it's peculiar. And All of this has to do with the town bylaw and not the state? No, it's both, I think. That's, that's my, um, cause the town bylaw is based on the state on the statute, mm -hmm. but like they use this, we have this phrase in there where possible, which is like I did a book. I spent more time on this really than I should be healthy, but um, it, you know, it probably should be if possible, but then it doesn't say, you know, what's possible. There's like, I've learned enough about law to know how much I really don't know, mm -hmm. but I've learned like there's like standards set for different things and there's no clear standard where it, when it says where possible, it's like where possible what, you know? Can I like, uh, you know, if I had an ax murderer that got nominated, can I choose not to appoint him? Or if he's appointed, do I have to appoint him? Um, we'll try not to give you those now. I'm sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> That's, but, you know, from like a... We, we are doing our homework to get that to you. I'm sure you guys will be fine. Yeah, I'm sure you guys will be fine. Um, the... Um, but it, it's really a peculiar bylaw, and it's not, or not bylaw, but law. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, um, there's been a lot of, like, there are a lot of court cases, but not really any dealing with appointments that I've come across. So, but the town charters, everything is very clear. Like, when you have an appointing authority, the appointing authority is, you know, it's appointing authority. If an you know, appointing authority can't make a choice, then they don't have the authority, you know? So it's really, it's peculiar. Um, now, the town bylaw was established when the district was established, and it's never been revised. 1977, right? yeah. It looks like what they did was take the wording from the statute that formed the uh, committee that formed the district to start with, mm -hmm. and just carried that over to the historic district. It looks like they just took the same wording and, and, and used it over again, which is probably wasn't probably the best thing in retrospect, but I don't think it's it, it worked for how many years? Yeah. It's only been the past few that someone all of a sudden that took an interest in who was being appointed. Prior to that, I think they just, you know, if, if you were interested, you were on the committee, basically. But, so so right. we're still adjusting, I guess, to how the appointment process works because it, it's, it's unique in um, town and it's, it's something that has never been Well, we're not a political issue. group, but we seem to be attached to you guys lately. Well, you're a political, it's a, there's a political issue involved. We're not profit private. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a political issue involved and that is, um, hopefully you guys will be able to stay as much out of it as you want. We're trying. Motion to adjourn. Uh, Mary, I just, I, guess I just have a question. How are we doing on soft right? Talking with the schools. The school at the, at the meeting last week was throwing it on us saying we're, we're the people who have lagged. And I didn't want to mention any names that I had, but I think we got to be clear then, Chris, who's holding up what? Because um, it's, this is kind of ludicrous. Well, everybody likes to point fingers on. Yeah. I guess I'll just, I'll take the blame, okay?
just go. For it. I'll just take. So the is it the school? I'll just take the blank. I'm not going to argue about it. If they don't feel that they, if they feel they're giving me everything they need to give me, they're lying at that point in time. So, but I'm not going to go out and start casting aspersion on everybody else. I'll take the blame. Well, it's more than blame. I'll it's take the blame. Getting this up and running. I will, I will take the blame. That's what I want. That's all I want. Okay. Yeah, I have a question on the school street. Uh, I comment uh, that's pretty much the same as what they're doing on 202 in Amherst. Do you know if all they're going to do is put a left-hand turn signal for each lane? Being a resident over in that area, I don't think that's going to accomplish anything to help people get out of School Street on either side. I think there's going to be a traffic light there. Yeah. They didn't mention a traffic light in that letter. It was just a left turn signal. I, my thought was the original we talked about if there was a traffic light on there. I heard any different. You saw that in that letter? Because I did not. I didn't in the letter, but that was in the original plan. Now, a left hand turn signal would indicate a traffic light. Not always. Sometimes it's just getting over and then waiting so the other person can. can that's just a lane. A left hand turn signal would be. Well, that's what I mean. It's a left hand lane for each lane to be able to turn. Onto school street. Uh, I'm sure almost it's positive light. it's a light uh, traffic sure? light. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say 100%, but I, I'd say about 90. I had talked to Eric Lesser, um, Is that chief of staff, and he had sent me the whole thing. It's still like a year or two off, but yeah, he said there was a light. Okay. I think I was somewhere. It didn't seem like it was going to hang. A left, that's going to do anything, like you said, no. No, I don't like this. There's no, not much to be really seen anything. Oh, I don't think, I think we're just not taking it. So that means that Nelly and Stephen Johnson are on the board? I think you rescind it. Oh, we're going to rescind it? Well, that's what you just said. So we need a vote then. All right, go ahead, make a motion. Make a motion that we rescind it. Just want to be on the board? The appointments. Can, can we talk about making them alternates? Yeah, that's what I thought the original plan was. So that, I thought they were. Good. I thought originally they were going to be alternates until we appointed them. I mean, as a appointing. And personally, I just I don't want, I don't want to do anything really until I hear from Ed. So I'll just leave it. As so if we're going to correct, if we're going to correct mistakes, we might as well correct. So no action. No action. That's that's my preference. So if it's in violation, it's in violation by the Well, they, no, the other, the other members are still on the board. Yeah, but is that in violation? What, that the other members are still on the board? No, that the two that we appointed. It seems to me that it could be. So why wouldn't we just rescind and wait until this, this uh, shakes out? Uh, personally, I would just wait until we get an answer from Ed. So I'm not rescind like you said. Well, I'll, I'll make a motion that we change their appointment to be alternate members. You'll have to second mark. Second. I'm not in favor of that. I'm in favor of not having any any of those members I'll until there. it shakes out. Aye. Aye. Those opposed? They're not voting alternate members at this point, and the committee remains as is until we hear from them. Uh, actually, as a committee, if you wanted to remain as is, uh, Lisa is still an alternate. And so, it's up to three. You, There's you three you alternates, so we can appoint. But you haven't replaced anybody. So we didn't the entire committee is. Yeah, actually, we did. She replaced um, Nancy. Nancy Brooks. And so she's promoted from a associate to a full member. We haven't rescinded that, so. Okay. Okay, Jim? I, I think I got it now. I'll, I'll check when you uh, adjourn. I'll double check when you adjourn. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anything else or motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor?